<gasps> What's going on, guys? Welcome to All Access Magic. I'm your host, Mr. Ryan Edwards, but not tonight. We have a special okay. guest. Yes, I'm your host, Mr. Blaze Sarah, and tonight yeah. we are joined by the one and only, the Bebe, the myth, the legend, Mr. Levi, Levi Edwards is with us in the house, but he's not very happy right now. Uh, he just finished feeding, and I kind of woke him up, bringing him in the office and stuff. So he's got a little bit of an ugly, a little crabby face going on right now, but uh, but he is uh, he's awesome. Born on Sunday, this past Sunday, big six pounds eight uh, eight ounces, so six and a half pounds basically. So 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 happy. so basically my lunch from yesterday. Yeah. Uh, but, I'm going to get him back to his mom because he is very grouchy, but uh, I hope that you guys have an awesome podcast tonight. You guys are going to be with uh, the one and the only tonight. Uh, I wouldn't even say who. The one and only. We've already seen it, but um, uh, it's going to be a good time. So I hope you have a great night with uh, I'm, uh, and... I'm going to try to tune in, so I'll be chatting in the chat, um, but uh, awesome. but I'm going to get this little guy down to bed and, uh, and then try to get some sleep myself. So thank you guys all for the support. Rest uh, up. Uh, Tigger T, his name is Levi. So, uh, Levi, this is the first night that he's been really cranky, or last night too. At, at that time, so. he was really calm, and then you were like, All right, you ready? And <laughs> yeah, usually he doesn't cry at all. So, yeah, he's like, Now he's just crying for, for some reason. So, it's the bright lights, he's not ready for them yet. So, he's not ready, he's not ready for the spotlight. No, but, you know, take a little soon, bit of time, a little bit of practice. But, uh, thanks so much, guys. You guys have a fun night, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Sounds great. See you soon. All right. Well, that leaves us. That leaves us with the main event of the evening. Fighting out of the blue corner. With a red gaming chair. <laughs> Weighing in at about 100 pounds and 50 pounds of beard. The man, the myth, <laughs> the legend. Eric, the man, the myth, the legend. Tate! I'm a uh, world champion, third place champion of card magic at FISM. What? Yeah, I, I'm a little concerned as to how you knew my exact weight. <laughs> Dude. Yeah, man. It was it was when we were doing the podcast. I was like constantly <laughs> seeing, <laughs> I was constantly trying to size you up. What's going on, Blaze? Good to see you. Thanks for having great me on. To see you, man. Yes, it is great to see you. Uh, and I feel like the last time that you were on the show, it was almost as if I wasn't even there because it was like 4 a.m. in <laughs> in London for me still. And uh, was now, not you'd very recently, You'd recently got jumped into an international magic gang and were very, <laughs> very excited about that. And then, yeah. and then Xavier <laughs> jumped into me. a magic gang and then Xavier actually gave you an interview. So it yeah. is nice to uh, properly have you here for, uh, Thank for you. the questions that I missed out on. <laughs> I'm curious as to what the other questions are, because uh, I already got the lasagna questions, so I don't know what's mm. going to happen tonight. Yes. And I'm sure that we did the uh, we did the 20 questions with you. I remember doing that, but I think that we did not do the new questions for you oh, so, no, excited. Uh, so i'm excited that's exciting also we never gave you the iq test so oh, many respect. many things are ahead of us tonight um we have ben jones in the house who Here. just said uh, hey i just wanted to say i saw i saw you live at fism and i absolutely loved it oh uh, thanks ben when i see uh tigger uh 7725 who comes to my live jam sessions on mondays on instagram on the penguin magic uh instagram is in the chat oh. so hi hi tigger good to see you welcome and, uh, welcome that's yeah. the, that's the same oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's all good yeah it's, it's all the good. same yeah, you're, you're, wow we have chats, so much chats, crossover man chat's popping off <laughs> chats popping off with our same 10 peeps in these streets now uh <laughs> now uh eric so you just got back from the world championship of magic yes which is a huge yes, deal I did. but before we talk about that experience i'd like to first talk about your process leading up to FISM how oh, sure. like how long did you know that you were going to compete at the 2022 FISM were you planning on it pre-COVID before everything got pushed or did you decide um, then that you're going to compete what happened so uh I I kind of thought my competing days were behind me after I won the IBM I was mm -hmm. like that's 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 a good mm -hmm. thing yeah. I can be sort of be done there and uh 
uh, then I went to 4F and did uh, an earlier version of that act. And someone who is involved in sort of the upper echelons of FISM was like, uh, that's a really cool FISM act. When are you going to take it to FISM? And I was like, ah, I, that's for legends. Um, <laughs> and uh, so uh, I had a number of people sort of be like, you should really go compete at FISM. Um, mm. And a lot of people, a, a lot of very, very smart, very knowledgeable people pushed me to do it and then gave me advice along the way. Um, and so that was sort of uh, like 2018, 2019-ish. Mm. And so I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to do this. Um, and then I didn't really know until 2021 because there's a qualification process for FISM that's sort of long and convoluted mm. and not interesting to talk about. But uh, I went to FISM NA in 2021 and did the, and qualified uh, for Team North America. And uh, and for, so I definitely knew for a year, um, but I had been kind of planning on it for like three, four years. Mm, wow, yeah. okay. Yeah. Interesting. And so, yeah, all after IBM, what year was the IBM competition that you won? I won in early 2018 early to mid 2018 was when i won yeah gotcha and yeah. what would you say is the difference between the act that you did at FISM compared to the act that you did in ibm was there a huge evolution between them or was it essentially yeah. the same act um i think to the untrained eye they're essentially the same um like the premise yeah, like so the premise has always been the same. The invisible three card Monty has always been the mm -hmm. same. I actually got a really nice um, compliment from someone uh, who shall re remain nameless, but they, they called me up afterwards and they were like, hey, it was like they said it was like watching um, a miracle jump. It, mm -hmm. That it was like it was an evolution in thought in the Monty, mm -hmm. at least. And so I was like, oh, that's really nice of you. Um, and I, I know that like not saying that person's name makes it seem like I just sort of like made that up. But I mean, because you some... did, but it's all right. Yeah. No, <laughs> that's uh, high I'll, tell, I'll tell you, I'll tell you off pod um, yeah. who said that to me because it. No, was, I'm sure was because a... I've I've also heard really incredible things about the act from many was... people that attended FISM. So uh, I'm sure that that was you know it was a sure it was a great you know I guess it was a really nice compliment and I never really thought of it that way. Um, the major changes were, so there's an end to it now that is like emotionally satisfying. Cause prior to that, the end was just sort of like, I'm going to do this really badass card muck. And if you know about card magic and card mucking, you'll be like, Hey, he can do that. Uh, and if you don't, then you're just like, Oh, okay. He, he won again. What, a, what, a, what a dirk. Mm. What a jerk. Um, so there was, uh, so there was an evolution to the end of it. And then about six months before the actual competition, uh, I completely re-choreographed it and changed the method. Um, wow. So in, in older versions of it, my hands would go below the table a lot. Uh, there was a lot of like Tony Slidini stuff where my mm. body would move and drag hands off. And in the new version, the hands almost never go below the table. Mm. Um, wow. Yeah. So That's and a huge evolution to it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically, I went talked to a bunch of very knowledgeable people on multiple sides of the law and uh started to use some really old gambling uh devices uh yeah. to get it done um uh, and then nice. had to invent a bunch of moves to make the gambling devices work with uh particular types of sleight of hand that i was using um and in reference to the chat uh you cannot see part of the routine now but you will soon i just got video from fism and i want nice. to clean I want to clean up the audio and sort of color correct it a bit before I post it. Well, that's very exciting. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. I'm just going to grab yeah. one that I have right here out of frame. Okay. Yeah, no problem. All right, we're good. All right. <laughs> we're back. So, interesting. So, yep. as you were f deciding upon this premise, Mm -hmm. What was, were you previously performing a three card Monty and then just decided what if this was invisible or how did the idea for the premise kind of come about? The, um, I think the invisible three card Monty sort of started a thought process that I've applied to a lot of effects these days, which is I, I sort of look at a common plot and then I try to identify like the one thing that definitely makes it that plot and mm. then answer the question like what would happen if you removed that fundamental thing mm. so like if you watch my invis if you watch my ambitious card the ambitious card that i do it it is a no gimmick 
uh, all sleight of hand ambitious card, but the ambitious card is a different color back. It's blue in a, mm. it's a blue card in a red deck. And so that mm. sort of like forces you to answer that question. Like how does the card come to the top of the deck in some interesting ways? Mm. Uh, and with three card Monty, the question was like, what if you were playing w with objects you couldn't see? Mm. Um, there was some other like jumps to get there. Uh, but, uh, ultimately I've been playing invisible three card Monty for like six years. Uh, it's just the, the, the concept is just like sort of continually evolved and it's gotten just sharper and tighter mm -hmm. and the methods gotten yeah. better. And so, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I'm just mm -hmm. taking a look at just from the uh, chat. Uh, Sean Hawk said, Eric love from Columbus, Ohio, born and raised here. I, I love that someone from Columbus represented at FISM. Congrats, by the way. Are you originally from Thank Columbus? You. Uh, I am not. I moved here a little over a decade ago, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm, I, you know, I'm in Columbus for the long haul and uh, hopefully I'm going to be, uh, Sean, you should check out the, uh, Columbus magic club and the Columbus IBM ring because, uh, mm. hopefully there's going to be more stuff going on with the IBM ring here in Columbus. Now that I'm not like on the road a lot, I'm hoping to be more active in the, the mm. local magic community. Nice. Lindsay Harvey said, have you invented a wrestling move? I think he's talking about a different kind of IBM ring. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, no i've not invented any yeah. wrestling moves no uh, wrestling moves yeah we'll have to work on that next time no i'm practice. quite fit i just can't wrestle to save my soul yeah i mean <laughs> with the ability to drop and gain 50 pounds just whether you shave or not it really impacts what weight class you know you can really dominate yeah. sometimes i'm welterweight sometimes i'm middleweight <laughs> exactly man <laughs> it just depends on how you're feeling if you're a little scruffly or not yeah now uh that, so leading up to Vism, Mm -hmm. you've done this act now for six years yep. you know iterations of it mm -hmm. are you nervous going into that performance more you know than any other performance are you ever nervous before you perform this routine and did fism change that uh i am always nervous before mm -hmm. i perform any routine i kind of think that if you're not nervous you don't belong on that stage Dude, I um, am so happy that you said this because I've talked with many people about this and I say before every single performance, I'm mm -hmm. nervous. Yeah. And then the moment I begin, I'm immediately not. But I'm always concerned about every single thing that that, oh, yeah. I, that could happen that I haven't accounted for. And the first thing in my mind right before I start performing is trying to run through all of the hypotheticals that I haven't yet accounted for. I mean, so of course, I, I'm going to be nervous. I found out that a FISM Grand Prix winner was going to be sitting at the table with me in competition 30 seconds before I went on. I mean, that is not something yeah. I could have anticipated or prepared for. Yeah. Uh, I did do a lot of mental preparation. I, th I think I've spoken about this at length in other places, but the, the Cliff Notes version is uh, I see a therapist on a regular basis for mm -hmm. depression and anxiety mm -hmm. and a bunch of other stuff. And uh, I think everyone should go to therapy. But when I was getting when when FISM became a very serious activity in my life, uh, I went to my therapist and I was like, all right, the big thing we have to handle is that I get the shakes really bad in front of magicians mm -hmm. um, and particularly in competition. And so we need to sort that out. And so we spent a year doing all kinds of cognitive therapy training, tapping uh, therapies and wow. uh, hypnosis and a lot of stuff. Uh, the mental prep for FISM was as intense, if not more intensive than the the rest of the work involved with it. I uh, am almost more interested in that than your FISM experience, because oh, I yeah. think that there are a lot of people who are in the comments that deal with very similar things that deal with shaking when they're performing from their nerves or that like I know that um, I didn't realize this to the extent until the moment that my fullest performance began, but mm -hmm. I apparently my hands get very sweaty. They don't shake, yep. but oh my gosh, I was like drenched and I had three indexes and I could not, I was slipping off of everything. And like, yep. I, I mean, if you watch my fullest performance, I ask so many questions to give myself mm -hmm. so much extra unnecessary time, but it's because I kept slipping off of every index. My fullest performance is the same thing. The people were like, you look so calm and so uh, like collected up there. But like there's one shot where I'm holding a card. And if you look carefully, you can see that I'm just I mean, like the card is mm. just going like that. Um, and 
there was there was a lot of stuff that we did uh, involving. Um, so there's a therapy that's like tapping that's a lot of use for anxiety and stuff like that, where like a therapist will lead you through this, and it involves like affirmations and mantras as you are tapping on various parts of your body mm -hmm. that are known to activate uh certain like glands and adrenaline and things like that and so we worked like we worked me getting into like a very uh heightened state of awareness or like mm -hmm. uh, we tried to like stress me out and like give me the shakes and then uh. use the tapping to like ground myself uh we did a lot of stuff where so i've i have a fairly specific table that i perform at um and i have a scrap of the fabric that i would take to therapy with me uh -huh. and so we would do this sort of like hypnotic routine where uh, we place the scrap on the couch, on the armchair of the couch. And so when this part of my wrist hit it, we had a post-hypnotic suggestion to put me into a relaxed state when mm. that part, because that's like a part of the wrist that would naturally move across the table and feel mm. that fabric. Mm. Uh, so there was, there was a lot of stuff like that. Wow. Um, there was a lot of like talking through like expectations and like what I wanted. Um, and ultimately all I wanted to do was participate. I mean, like, coming home with this mm -hmm. is amazing um yeah. uh you know finding out afterwards that i'm the fourth american to stand on the podium for card magic in the history of vism is wow. awesome but that wasn't that wasn't the goal the goal was to go participate and and do well like mm -hmm. to be happy with my performance and that is what i came away with anything else was just amazing just wonderful and extra stuff yeah, yeah 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 um grant <laughs> yeah i mean there there's some comments about like um well what one i love ticker t's comment i love it uh, when guys are self-aware enough to know that their mental health matters yeah yes yeah. i mean i think there's you know as everyone uh there's been a culture you know of not necessarily encouraging going to therapy for a long time and i think it's mm -hmm. only in certain places that it's more common like in america it's very common for people to suggest going to therapy and things and talking to someone about your feelings but even in places mm -hmm. like the uk that are still you know very western or whatever it's not yeah. uh you know it's not as common at all so um yeah yeah, I, th I think that it's it's a cultural thing and uh, and having someone that you can that you can talk with about those things uh, that also isn't like immediately in your life that yeah. you're offloading your emotions onto is a very good thing. Yeah. I think that the important thing, too, is to also understand that, like, not every therapist is one size fits all. I saw like four or five different therapists until I found the one that I'm with mm -hmm. right now who, like, she's able to stand me up against a wall and call me on my bullshit. She knows how to cut through, like, all of my deflections, wow. whereas, like, there's other therapists who, like, could never, mm -hmm. I mean, could never. I, I remember uh, my therapist uh, had a child. Like, she she had she did the thing that Ryan Edwards did where her, like, yeah her DNA became sentient. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. When there's like but I a mini me. Yeah. Yeah. But I had to go see somebody else and it just like, you know, it was like I could vent, but it wasn't somebody who could actually help me process stuff. Mm. And so like the point is like, don't just go, but like find someone that will work with you to make you actively better because it is a process. Sorry. Yeah, End of rant. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. It's it's very that's very helpful for a lot of people. So that's interesting that you you went through a lot of the moments in your routine that you felt would generate anxiety and then created these kind of post hypnotic suggestions related to the gestures or the moments when you would hit that fabric or something so that yeah. in the moment when you would normally become more anxious and start shaking, you're now influenced to be less stressed. Yeah. Now, did you, were you aware of that during your performance uh, or at that point is everything so locked into your muscle memory as choreography that like are, what are, are what's going through your mind during a FISM performance? Are you thinking? Are you present? or are you just on autopilot what's happening I, there i worked pretty hard to be present um so there's a there's a sequence that happens at the very beginning so we we somebody opens a brand new deck of cards it's shuffled between two people they like wash it all over the table i look at the deck for about 15 20 seconds and then while monologuing i shuffle the aces to the middle of the deck and then dead cut mm. them out of the deck mm. um it's a uh, it's a really technically difficult sequence. Um, it's arguably one of the more difficult things I do. And also, like when magicians look at it, they're like, "This guy's just slapping his junk on the table." I mean, like his like he's really just showing us the extent mm -hmm. of his abilities before he gets into mm -hmm. other stuff. Um, and 
that getting through there was a lot of nerves involved with that because i know how sort of like walking on a wire that is mm. and there's a lot of different ways that can go mm. um and so it's not improvisational but depending on what happens i've got different ways to make it look like i did this the way i meant to but mm. it it went the way i wanted it to and when that happened that immediately relaxed me and slowed mm. me down and allowed me to be very present nice um, because you the, you were like all right the most like yeah. risky moment is already yeah. kind of gone and i i feel similar in certain things like there are things that I do that are maybe more technically difficult, but I feel as though I'm very in control of what's happening. Like I, yeah. I'm in charge of that. There's nothing that's up to chance. Like I, I'm controlling just that one card in that one moment. Whereas like yeah. what you're talking about with dead cutting, there is an element of like, you know, something could go wrong mm -hmm. just by chance. And you just practice as much as you can to avoid that. But yeah, you, you know, you are risking things. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's a there's a thing in the middle. Sorry, I need to address your chat real quick. Of all the magicians named Eric, who's your favorite? Eric Casey, obviously. Um, One and only. But uh, there's some other. There's a sequence in the middle. There's a in phase two, as I call it, uh, where the one of my audience members is asked a question. They're asked to make a choice, and they genuinely have a free choice. But there's been a lot of like groundwork laid up to this point to get them to choose something specifically that scripting wise is the most emotionally satisfying and that had been a huge source of anxiety for months leading up to it because i was only able to hit that like 70 percent of the time mm -hmm. um wow. and when sean sat next to me sean farquhar was put at the table with me mm. uh all of the anxiety around that went away because sean has sat where i am like as a competitor and he's not gonna fuck around yeah. he's gonna like hear those cues and be like oh this is what the guy wants like he's not gonna like be like oh i'm gonna well i know he clearly wants me to pick the second one so i'm gonna pick the third one just to yeah. see what he if he can dance around it so there was a lot of like oh okay like like sean didn't help me but there was this feeling of like, my buddy is here. I'm getting to yeah. do this for a friend, which is mm. like very comforting. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So mm -hmm. when you got there and you saw the other competitors, were you able to have a chance to watch some of the other acts or were you really just focused on making sure that you were ready for your own performance? I watched every single competition act with mm. the exception of uh, the stage competition on the day mm. that I competed um, just because my tech rehearsal was during the time that the stage mm. competition was but I watched every single competitor in all categories mm. and so and, when you watch yeah. that not now this is an interesting question because mm -hmm. uh, not to um, put anybody down or anything but yeah. when you watched all the performances how did you feel about where you stacked up because obviously you hadn't seen necessarily all of the performers going into mm -hmm. FISM were there some things that really surprised you that you were like this is this is very different I've never seen oh. this before yeah there was only one competitor so I mean a we're separated into categories so you know like yes i knew simon cornell's thing uh piece was amazing mm. but i also like didn't feel the pressure of competing against that because he mm. was in micro and i was in cards mm. uh in the card category i only knew of one other competitor i'd only seen one other competitor's thing mm, wow uh, a, a competitor's piece and so everybody else was totally new to me and um i want to i FISM is an art competition. At the end of the day, mm -hmm. you can't like, we're yeah. all doing art and, and yeah. a little bit of it is subjective, right? Yeah. Uh, totally. Markaby, the first place winner, has become a good friend. Uh, si and since perform I ran up to him as soon as he got done. And I was mm -hmm. like, you know, as soon as we were walking out of the theater after he performed, he got a standing ovation. And I was like, that was amazing. That was so much fun. Mm -hmm. I, I can't believe how much fun that was to watch. Um, and his yeah. his act truly was wonderful uh and i knew that he won with the moment the moment he was done i was like mm. that's the guy to beat wow. uh, unless i can catch fire in the same with the audience the same way he did that guy is first mm. and and ev everything else is a knife fight for second place um and as i watch the other competitors i don't 
I don't want to sound arrogant or pejorative of them. Yeah, totally. But I felt fairly confident in where I would rank. Mm. Um, and That's, so yeah. I didn't, I, I didn't think I was going to get a prize, but I thought I was going to be like in the top five. Gotcha. Um, yeah, and yeah. so, so I was like, well, you know, top five, like could mean I win a prize, but also like, it'd be, it'd be really nice to like be sort of up there, yeah. uh, which would, which would be cool. Do you think that not being familiar with the other acts and who you're competing against prior was a, a benefit to you and your mentality and your anxieties? Or do you think that you maybe would have been better to know what you were up against prior to going in? I like knowing what I'm up against. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of I mean, I think that in competition, it's as important to study mm. what you're up against as it is to perfect your own piece. Um, just because like, you know, I watched a lot of Fizzamax, as many Fizzamax that I could on YouTube beforehand to see yeah. what Fizzamax were, were like and what was interesting. Um, it, you know, I mean, competition is like anything else. I mean, there are trends. Uh, there are definitely for for the last two to three fisms uh, prior to this one, having a table that could do amazing things for mm -hmm. you was was definitely a trend, yeah. and it was pretty clear the way they put the 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 way they placed the judges in this that that there was an there was an effort that was like your table has to be really good or you know or or we want something different. Yeah. Um, uh, and it was, you know, whether or not that was an intentional cue from the judges or the organizers or whatever. I mean, like it was my understanding is that it was definitely different than it was in the past. I mean, the judges were right. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, none of the judges were like watching acts from the screen. They were like there. I mean, you could see them all. In, you could look them all in the eye. I um, see. Gotcha. So then the close up competition was a proper close up competition for card magic. Oh, I think the so. way yeah. it, which and that that's an interesting thing, because um you'd expect it's obviously expected after like someone like shin does very well with mm -hmm. an act that is meant to be watched on camera meant to be watched on screen that yeah there's going to be a wave of people doing acts that are that are meant to be watched on screen yeah. um but it is it does kind of put some people in, in an interesting place of like well, how do you compare something that is meant to be watched just from one angle with mm -hmm. something that is meant to be watched surrounded? And there's a lot of work put into it being able to cover those side angles. You know, it's like someone putting all of their work into a performance that's just for one screen is kind of almost a different a different division in its, in and of itself, you know? Yeah, you know, I've heard a lot of people trying to make a call for like having like, camera magic or virtual magic or however but you I don't think that necessarily like a separate category yeah. yeah um but I also think that like I mean look I'm basically done competing mm -hmm. um but so I don't really have a dog in this fight apart from I want to support anyone who wants to go compete at FISM uh that that being said a lot of my work has changed because I'm playing larger and larger venues and mm. my clients want to see close up magic, but they want to see it in a way that they can show it to 500, 600,000 mm. people. And so learning to play to a camera as a close up, man, talk to Eric Jones about doing yeah. close up. On oh Disney yeah. I mean, ships. he's doing very tiny stuff. Huge. Yeah. Mm. I mean, there, there is, that is a, a very clear skill that is um that I, I that i think is a valuable one to learn and mm. the question really becomes uh where how do you value that in competition um yeah because, and i guess i guess it becomes yeah. an interesting thing of um i guess what i was more getting at was not the idea of something that is being viewed through the screen versus something surrounded i guess what i was more getting at is like when you mention tables, I think of, okay, this act can't really be watched by the human eye. It must mm. be watched through a screen yeah. because if someone were at a different angle, then it would severely impact their experience. So then I'm like, you know, it, do those belong together? But also I'm not arguing that they should be separated. It's just an interesting thing to think about.
Well, the, I you know I think close up close up at FISM arguably is the tables category. I mean, there is mm -hmm. a specific designated setup time and a designated strike time, and the way most people get around that is that they just have a table that they bring that everything is set up on, and they mm -hmm. carry it on and they carry it off. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they can do all of their if they have like an hour long setup, they can do all of that beforehand, and then when it comes to the time to like get on the stage and get off, they can be within that three minute two minute two minute time limit. Um, and, and as a result of that, a lot of people go, well, if I got to carry this table on, it should do some crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, there was, a uh, uh, air one, no, no, not air one. Um, I'm trying to think there was another French magician who had like this thing where he transformed into a red guy and a blue guy and his table did some crazy stuff, but none of it was black art, at least as far mm -hmm. as I could tell. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you know, another really good example of that is actually, um, the FISM, uh, Grand Prix winner, uh. Uh, well, this isn't a table. Um, I was thinking of Jan Frisch, but it's not like his table does stuff. But he's got stuff like stuck to the back of the table. I'm not revealing anything there. That's yeah. he's published. The, his, he's published how his routine works. Um, but there's a lot of people who have tables that do things that are not necessarily black art. Mine is an example um, mm -hmm. uh, where my table has features that I cannot perform that act without my table but none of it's black art stuff there's there's, there's other yeah. things going on there oh definitely uh yeah we got a comment jackie you was a mm -hmm. fantastic camera magician jackie you was a oh. fantastic magician oh, yeah. in general and the thing is that he yeah. he has expertise in so many different types of magic it is unbelievable how jackie can just like start demonstrating like oh, ball yeah. manipulation and stage magic and things or just switch so into good. you know <laughs> card manipulation or sleight of hand close up he's he's really a master um, so Grant H in your chat has a really interesting question that I want to address because I got that a lot leading mm -hmm. up to it and I got it a lot afterwards, which is why don't they televise FISM or any magic competitions? FISM has been televised in certain countries in the past. It is up to the host country whether or not that happens. However, televising a magic competition can become a digital rights nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, so because... Uh, most competitors, uh, some competitors, uh, you have to get permission from the competitor to televise their act, like mm -hmm. whether or not they get permission for that. But sometimes competitors will use music that is not commercially available uh, and commercially yeah. viable to stream uh, or broadcast. And so you would then have to obtain those. So like my music was custom for me. So I had broadcast rights for it. But yeah. there were definitely close-up competitors that were using music that they wouldn't have had the ability to broadcast and they may not even be able to post it on YouTube because of the, the rights management there. So yeah, that's so a big nightmare. Yeah. It's a huge nightmare uh, for, for that kind of stuff. I mean, and particularly with any acts that use music and music is definitely a trend that is happening more and more and more. Definitely. Yeah. Um, as someone who ran an online magic competition, which is just a small microcosm of this, it is yeah. definitely a big, a big issue for a lot of people oh, yeah. who choreograph acts to songs. And, uh, and also there are issues sometimes where you, um, might believe that you can get clearance for something. And then it turns out that you can't last minute because of changes. Like even, even for example, I have a video that uh, I posted on Instagram last month and I used an Instagram approved audio. And now mm -hmm. the entire audio is not able to be viewed on my video, like even the dialogue and everything. Mm -hmm. And there's no way for me to change it because that song is no longer in Instagram's Rolodex. They stopped paying for the rights. And so now all of the people who use that song are screwed and yeah. their video can't be listened to. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of people who would want it broadcast, competitors and uh, the producers included. It's just that actually broadcasting it is very difficult. Mm. Um, and and I know that there are fisms in the past where people where they have broadcasted on television in that country, and uh, even then it was very controversial that it was broadcast uh, among mm. a lot of the people participating. And so it's just it's not a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just telling you like this is why like that that kind of thing doesn't happen. So. Yeah, and, and the thing is also, um, I'm sure anyone who knows someone who has been to FISM or competed in FISM has heard of some example of technical issues. It oh, happens yeah. every single magic convention, competition, anything. There are always technical issues. And mm -hmm. that is a real issue if you're trying to live broadcast 
a competition, especially it, now, obviously we're not saying that they necessarily do do it live. Uh, you know, there might be a chance for them to pre-record everything and then edit it yeah. and broadcast it later. But if you're trying to do a live broadcast of a magic competition, it's almost not possible for something like FISM because you would have a lot of infuriated acts if there was ever a technical issue that could expose some of their method live on television. Look, I had one of the better technical experiences at FISM and I had mm. one of the better camera experiences at FISM. Mm. The, the operator who was working mine was was just spot on. But, you know, I got 10 minutes with the guy to do a technical rehearsal and I wasn't able to actually do a full audio rehearsal with my mic and my music at full mm. level because the room was right next to the stage competition and they couldn't do that because it would interrupt the stage competition so on some level i was like i didn't actually get a technical rehearsal uh but also i wasn't able to run the act for the <coughs> later so that he could see what everything should look like um and so the video that i paid for of it like there's big sections of it that are just cut off where i'm like you know i mean the guy did the best he could but it was just under the circumstances and there's no video of the audience uh reacting to it so i mean i did get like a large portion of the audience gave me a standing ovation but i've mm. got there's no video of that mm. um just because of the way it was all set up so i mean it's yeah. just producing a television show is a huge thing and doing it in a competition format and keeping the competition pure is crazy difficult yeah and the thing is that um as someone who's like worked behind the scenes on AGT a couple times, it yep. is they it, people don't realize the amount of control that the producers have of acts. And that is because mm -hmm. they the thing that comes first is making sure that the TV show runs smoothly. Yep. So they have to change a lot of acts and the content in order to make sure that it works well for the way that they have set up this TV show. And so, you know, if you're an act that is kind of locked and set in your ways and you're like, this is the way that I've choreographed. I mean, I remember mm -hmm. Less than a week before Shin had to do the finals, they told mm -hmm. him he had to change his song entirely twice. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh, yeah, psych, we actually don't have clearance for that. Yeah. And FISM, like, you know, th their job is to make good TV. But the most important thing is, in FISM is the integrity of the competition itself. And you can't, you know, so you you may not have good. You may not have you may not be making good television. Mm. Now. The. Uh, OK, so <laughs> when you yeah. were competing, mm -hmm. because I, I'd like to start moving a little bit away from FISM, but yeah, sure, um, sure. around the competition, what would you say was your experience with the other competitors? Like, was there a, this camaraderie of everyone? Was there a competitive environment or vibe? Was there any drama that you saw? Uh, yes. Um to all things to mm. it's all of that uh you know i got to meet i one of the things that i love about competing is that i've made some really great friends uh mm. in competing and one of the horrible things about competing is that you find out the true nature of some people um mm. and so uh but i choose to focus on the positive and i've met some really wonderful people mm. uh you know becoming friends with uh with a number of the other competitors has been really awesome because they were people that i always really looked up to and saw as just these icons and then to now call them my friends is uh is is really something special so um mm. it's yeah it's it's great it's great um and what's really interesting also is is ending up like becoming friends with prior FISM competitors and FISM mm. winners and champions and uh you you come onto the you come sort of through this gauntlet onto the other side and uh it it really sort of the the rankings kind of fall away and it's just like you, you it like it doesn't matter if you mm -hmm. want a prize or not you've just been through it you're on the other side yeah and there's very there's like a handful of people in the world who can who can sort of share this experience of going through competition this intense at this level and it's Absolutely. uh it's been it's been a really it's been really rewarding and been really nice to meet and and share this experience with some great people that's awesome Wow. Hmm. So I feel like we should uh, we should probably start moving away from uh, from FISM. But okay. I keep I keep getting more questions that come to mind, which is yeah. now as you're transitioning away from that and mm -hmm. you're focusing just on like, you know, your career as a magician, both performing and working behind the scenes at Penguin. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if 
you were to give advice to someone who is interested in competing in something like this, what would you say are the differences between creating an act for a professional performing magician versus creating an act for a competing magician? Would you say that there are differences in that creative process and also oh, yeah. the type of act that ends up being made? Should someone take an act that they would normally perform and try and convert it to something that works for competition or start entirely new and fresh what, what are your thoughts i think that question is different for everybody i think the question you have to ask yourself first is why are you competing for me competing was always to get noticed so that i could lecture because i what i really like doing is teaching that's my mm. favorite thing to do that's why i have the best job in magic at penguin is because i get to teach magic all the time mm. um and i think you need to understand why you want to compete um and then when it comes to the creative process it i don't think there's a difference in creating for in, in you don't need to change your creative process whether it's for competition or for like a, a working pro or whatever uh but you do need to acknowledge that the venue is different a competition is a har highly artificial environment um you're not always you know it, at levels <coughs> below FISM, you're not always in sort of like a a well-managed stage format with you know video yeah. support audio support lighting sound all that stuff uh, you know, at, at a lot of the lower levels, you're basically, you show up and you walk into a conference room and you got to do your act under very harsh conditions that are just like really unforgiving for a room full of magicians who are going to react all the wrong ways. Every, every time that you have done this act in front of other people and it got laughs or gasps, you're not going to get that in front of magicians. And so you have to like really calibrate like what your expectations are. Um, mm. you know, and you know, if they've seen it before, like, you know, as you're as you're moving into higher levels of competition, you got to figure out ways to like show people that it's like different if they've seen it before. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that was definitely an issue that I had where it was like, I did this act on Fool Us. Every mm -hmm. magician in the world has seen me do the Invisible mm -hmm. Three Card Monty. So how do I make it so that it's still compelling and you want to watch it? Um, I mean, there's there's lots of there's lots of considerations like that. Uh, yeah. But I, I think the main thing is just go do it. If you decide you want to compete and the reasons you want to compete are reasons that you're happy with, mm. go do it. I mean, you know, TAOM is coming up. PCAM is coming up. Uh, you know, the Winter Carnival of Magic is a great place. MAS is coming up. I, you know, I can't speak for competitors in Europe, but, um, you know, my, my role in competing is now to support any American competitor who wants to compete at higher levels. Mm. I'm the first American in 20 years to stand on the podium for card magic. I'm the fourth American in history to stand on the podium for card magic. Wow. I should not be an aberration. I should mm. be the beginning of a tradition. We have some mm. of the best card magicians in the world. We just don't send them to compete. Um, and mm. so I'd kind of like to change that. And, yeah. uh, and however I can support competitors, I will. That's awesome. Now, would you say that the experience performing for a crowd of magicians is a fun experience? Or would you say it's kind of a means to an end so that you can then, you know, just get through that so that then you can, you know, have competed so that then you can lecture and all of those things? It can be fun. Um, one of the reasons I like lecturing is because the lecture is a show for magicians where I can like play mm. inside baseball with jokes mm. and do and make references that I can't make anywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, you know, I do like performing for magicians, but it took me a while to figure out how to perform for magicians um, and to figure out that same relaxed state that I get in with uh, with lay people that makes me like really catch fire with them. Um, Cause I think when you go to see me, when you go to see me in a, in a venue at Chicago magic lounge, it's very different than seeing me at a, you know, at a, uh, at, at a convention. And I'm hoping to get to the point where seeing me at a convention is like seeing me at the Chicago magic lounge. Mm. Cause I think I'm at my best when I'm at the mm. lounge. Um, and you know, it's, it's just, it's just different. You just have to, I mean, it's, it's an artificial situation. And so understanding that it's artificial can help inform how you approach it and how to make it as fun as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that with an act like that for competition, you need to make alterations to the act that don't necessarily affect the entertainment value at all, but you know will be appreciated methodologically? Oh, absolutely. Um, 
there are things that happen in my competition act which are just blow offs to to throw you away <laughs> from the methods that really don't make any sense. There's a <laughs> just don't make any sense. Just a total no. red herring. Just throw it in. <laughs> There's a um uh it, you know if I ever release the act to be purchased uh through Penguin Magic, um I I will go into all of the things that I fa- so there is for no reason other than it will point to a method that you then later realize is impossible. I fake a one-handed bottom palm uh, okay. uh, in it. There's a there's a Erdnay's shift that happens mm. for no reason, um, but points to a method that might be happening, but it's mm. happening out of sequence. Uh, mm. And then there's a lot of um, moving through various palms that I wouldn't need to do for lay people, but in order to show my fingers open in different ways uh, that only a magician would pay attention to interesting wow yeah. okay yeah, um, yeah yeah but that was all like stuff that i was like well I'm competing at fism i should just really show off <laughs> so. Mm, yeah, yeah so then in order to do that do you have to then record your own act and then watch the act back through your own eyes as a magician that's trying to break down everything and then go how can i then change these microscopic moments in order to then throw off me you know as if i was yep. as me with as if me with all of my expertise was watching it and by me i mean you, <laughs> you know? yeah i mean it's it's definitely something that you have to consider i mean eric bus told me something interesting when i was getting ready to go compete he, he said you know it's not individuals that win fism it's teams and mm. so get a team around you and so a, mm. a lot of people a lot of magicians that i'm that i i, I appreciate their thoughts and who are knowledgeable watch the act and told me things and then mm. another great magician keith field said listen to everybody and then ignore them and do it what you great, think yeah. is right and mm. so i saw so I, I did both of those things um and there's a lot of stuff that happens that is the that are the ideas of other people uh in my act mm. um and so it's but you do need to watch it and then just go like oh is this my magician brain is is making me do this or do I need to do this because my magician brain just immediately picks up on what's going on? Like mm. taking a linking ring act into a competition is like, is kind of strange because we all know how the linking yeah. rings work. Mm. And so unless you're really doing something that like throws them off, like yeah. why are you, are you, why are you performing that act in competition? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it because you do the linking rings better than anyone else in the world? Or is it because you have some genuine innovations that are going to fool them? Because at the end of the day, also a magic competition is about being fooling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And the the one thing that is definitely missing from my FISM act is that it is it's only got one or two deeply fooling moments. And the rest mm -hmm. of it is like misdirection moments or you watch it as a magician and you go, oh, shit, that guy's doing that move. Mm. Damn, damn. Gotcha. Yeah, that so they that it's appreciated, but at the same time, it's like you know that they're appreciated because they know how it's done, rather than yeah. appreciated because they're deceived. Yeah, and technical technical skill matters in a competition. I mean, there that is definitely yeah. something you were scored upon. Uh, but you know, lay people watch the act and they love it, and they have no idea how it works. And mm. magicians like. I think magicians like watching lay people watch it more than they like watching it themselves. Mm which is kind of a strange thing to think about but it's it's just it i think it's just because they they're like oh i wish i could be fooled by this but i can't because i can see through it mm. we have a, a question from Lindsay saying uh mm -hmm. do you have to submit the act before they let you in um well you yes. did you you had to you had to qualify by competing with that act correct Yes. So in the qualifying in the qualifying competition, you do have to submit it. Um, and then they tell you whether or not you are allowed in. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just like one filter. And then the the qualifying competition, you have to not only uh, you have to score above a certain point score. Uh, I think it's like 70. You have to score 70 points or above in order to qualify to represent uh, your organization at FISM. Mm -hmm. um, there is also the other way in is uh, a member, a FISM member body organization president can write you a letter and recommend you in. Mm -hmm. um, but that is uh, that happens less and less. Um, I believe there is a rule that if an organization mm -hmm. submits a number of competitors who are not FISM quality, 
uh, mm-hmm. as determined by the judges, then that organization loses their ability to submit wow. uh, competitors in the future. Um, and my understanding that is that has happened recently uh, to, to, to an organization. Yeah. Wow. Um, now, what happens, like you said, that you made all of these iterations of the act? What happens if you submit the act and then, you know, a month before FISM, you have this amazing idea for how to improve the act? Are you able to incorporate that idea? Oh, yeah. That de- I mean, that happened to me. I mean, the, okay. the ending of my act uh, changed three or three or four months before FISM mm-hmm. um, happened. Uh, over the The overall act has to be pretty well the same but you can change whatever you want and they they rec- they recognize that mm. and i don't think that they have a real threshold for like i mean like you can't do one act and then show up and just do something completely different like that would not be yeah. okay yeah. but like in general the act has to like be- it just becomes theseus's ship at this point of when is it still the same act like you walk out and you say the yeah. same opening line and then just completely change props like, yeah, like you couldn't like walk in and compete with like the ambitious card and it to qualify and then get there and be like, oh, okay, I got in for the ambitious card. Now I'm going to do a manipulation act on stage. Like you yeah. can't just like completely yeah, yeah. change it, you yeah. know, or even just go like, oh, you know, fuck cards. I'm doing cups and balls now. I mean, like you have to compete with like what is what what most reasonable people would say is the same act. Yeah. Yeah, and then, uh, <laughs> as you said, my real question is, can you qualify and then do a really poor act on purpose? I, yeah, mean, you could, I you guess could, you can. You can. I mean, like, I don't know why There's you would do that. Too. It is a terribly expensive process to to do that. I mean, if yeah. you just want to go down in history as the person who shit the bed for, <laughs> for, for fun, I mean, like, fine. Just, yeah, just came in with an amazing qualifier and then just yeah. <laughs> did not even know how to do magic at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's... You totally can. Yeah. Totally can. Now, uh, okay, so moving away from FISM, how do you allocate your time nowadays? Are you f- finding that you're doing more live performances since d- competing? Um, also, do I you mean, feel we, that... Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, what were you going to say? <laughs> we, we uh, you know, I, can, I, I received this large piece of glass a month ago. So mm-hmm. the answer is, uh, it takes a while for that to circulate and start mm-hmm. coming back. Gotcha. Um, no, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm doing more podcasts. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice. This is really, that's the goal. That's the goal is to be doing more yeah. podcasts to allocate all of your time yeah. to podcasts is really, uh, you're living the dream. No, I'm still doing lots of stuff with penguin. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, yeah. I host, I host the penguin live lectures. I host the podcast. I, pitch tricks i do the uh i do the live stream on mondays where we do the card jam mm. uh my day-to-day has not changed um mm. how there are some conventions that are booking me next year that probably wouldn't have booked me if i hadn't mm. become a fism winner um but uh, uh they would have booked me eventually nice <laughs> no. interesting okay so now since you had all of this build up to to the competition where you were going to you're talking with your therapist and working through these anxieties and things. Do you, f- did you feel a huge weight off of your shoulders and oh, like yeah. you could breathe uh, like this huge, you know, sigh of relief after that performance. And do you also feel like you have maybe a higher threshold for anxiety as you go throughout your life because of this huge thing that you've been able to overcome? Yes. To both questions. Next, ne- next, next, next <laughs> all right <laughs> yeah um well tigger wants to know are you going to ask eric the 20 questions we have asked the 20 questions uh previously what is this i was just thinking uh from a marketing perspective yes amazing entry and then do a magic orthodoxy double. <laughs> first of all how dare you smear the name of magic orthodoxy <laughs> that was amazing that... <laughs> dude i've never seen his double lift however comma what a great comment oh man <laughs> how dare you Lindsay? how dare how absolute dare how dare you man Lindsay? you really bamboozled me there i was trying to <laughs> I was trying to get over it. Now, uh, are there any resources, any books that you've read uh, when it comes to, um, you know, overcoming, uh, you know, uh, performance anxiety or like, you know, working on uh, an act, anything like that? Is Are there any books that you've read that helped 
with the, this kind of process? The best, I think the best uh, resource that I could direct people to immediately mm -hmm. is uh, um, Rick Merrill has a set of lecture notes about his FISM experience that was oh, very helpful. Yeah, yeah. And his, he talks, his, Rick has talked so all, great. It's so good. You know, I mean, he went and won the Grand Prix his first time out, didn't, mm -hmm. you know, just did it. Uh, and uh, his notes on his competition experience were very illuminating. Um, mm. But other than that, I don't know of any like manuals on how to compete. I don't know. Mm. Maybe it's something I should write. I'm not sure. Maybe you should. Yeah. And uh, and because you have such a great voice, I'd probably say you'd have to, you know, record. You know what I'm going to say? You'd have to record an audio book and uh, let everybody know about this experience on audibletrial.com slash magic <laughs> so they can find you know many other books about mental health overcoming anxieties going to therapy and uh and also just how to improve your life <laughs> for example you can check out meditation books by jay shetty on audible for free <laughs> using the code and i think that that will help you to get into the right mindset so that you can <laughs> compete to the best of your ability would you agree that was the absolute smoothest commercial i've ever heard in the middle of an interview congratulations <laughs> no it wasn't it wasn't as good as we've had before because usually Lindsay and tigger are in the comments and they start asking questions to the guest that subtly introduce the idea of audiobooks but don't fully get them there they're like like eric casey was on and one of them asked and eric mentioned like hurting his leg or something and going in for an mri and then mm -hmm. uh one of them was like you know now, were there any audiobooks you listened to before you went into your procedure to really get in the right headspace? And he was like, Oh, I love this Carrie Fisher book, and this just starts scrolling underneath. That was pretty good. That was that was pretty good. I was not expecting that. Well, oh, well yeah. played. Well played. Well played. Well played. Well played, Slays Barra. Says Blair is in the house. Uh, is Says Blair is still in the comments. We did have a comment from Says Blair. I think he was asking you to come up with a wrestling move earlier. Um we also do have a uh, a word from Says Blair that was posted uh, was posted yesterday, so I think that we just need to bring this. Up. <laughs> now, uh, how long have you been working for Penguin? Uh, five years now, I think four, four, five, four or five years now. I've been been around a while. Wow. Okay. And uh, and at least now, four. when are at you least four to uh, the all access team? No. <laughs> Uh, no, I've got a I got a great job at Penguin, and uh, you, you'd need to you, you'd need to. It would be a lot try and steal you away from that. We yeah. do have this word that was posted yesterday from. The Sam only Blair. question I want to know is who is Celis Blera? <laughs> the only question I want to know is who is Celis Blera? So, man, he's still alive. He's still active. I uh, I promise it's not me <laughs> that's making these posts, but it popped up in my Instagram feed, and I was like, oh, I need to. Need a shout out, says Blara. Is there a is there a Tarek Eight? <laughs> no, there isn't. There's there's only there's only an Eric Tate. There's only an Eric Tate. Uh, there, I do have an alter ego. I used to do these uh, 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 character roasts. Uh, we would roast like Batman or Superman or Luke Skywalker, and I would always roast them as uh, Brett Harlow, and uh, he was always represented like a citizen of Gotham or a citizen of Metropolis or just like another X-Wing pilot who was just like an ordinary person who was constantly adversely affected by the awful, awful people uh, who, who are, so Brett Harlow was the, was, is the only alter Brett ego Harlow I have. Is alter ego. Um, yeah, but, but, he, but Brett Harlow is just like a normal dude who is like very upset that Batman drives a tank through the city all the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's just the one guy who's actually getting inconvenience. Like he's yeah. like the cabbages guy who keeps getting his stand blown over by the avatar who's saving somebody. Yeah. Yeah, he's just like I. I just got my. I just got my car. Uh, the windows replaced to my car, and then Superman's trying to save people from a from a building with a with these sonic booms and the glass breaks again. It's, yeah, uh, it's these windshield yeah. replaced again, yeah. man. What a yeah. life. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's my only alter ego is Brett Harlow. Now I I asked this question to Richard Young earlier today, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm curious about your experience as a podcast host. Yes. Um, has there been a guest 
who was completely different from your expectation of them. And I don't want to assert any bias in either direction of what that means. But yeah, I, I mean, I, you were a lot smarter than I thought you were going to be. I assumed you were going to be a real big dummy. Um, it's just like I was I was just prepared to ask like questions about like what it's like to be a surfer and an underwear model. And then you had like real good comments about magic. Dude, man, I uh, <laughs> if you asked me surfing questions, what I had no idea. I would have been um, able to tell you about how to fall on your face. I so I but thank you. Very podcast. Thank you. I, very seldomly do I end up with someone who is different than I thought they were going to be, but mostly because I am not in a situation. I am usually not in a situation where I am asking someone to come on sort of cold where I'm like, mm -hmm. hey, would you come on and do this? Uh, usually I'm interviewing a penguin artist that I have spent four or five days with beforehand or in your case someone who i've been friends with for years so i'm like oh okay like i know that blaze is like gonna have like really interesting thoughts about these things and i can sort of feed him questions that will th then lead into it mm -hmm. uh so uh you know the the episode that comes out tomorrow is uh larry wilmore uh who was a uh, featured on the daily show the office he hosted the nightly show after colbert uh left his position uh and he's create he's co-created you know incredible shows he's peabody and emmy award winner and his the conversation i had with him was interesting i wouldn't say that it was like different than i thought it was going to be mm -hmm. but it definitely the conversation went off in areas i was not expecting and i think usually that's what happens to me yeah. is that we i'll go in thinking that we're going to go some direction and it ends up going somewhere else interesting okay has there ever been an interview that went off the rails just completely off the rails. Uh, I feel like you're too good of a host for that to happen. I feel like you would just be able to reel things in or you'd be like, all right, next question. <laughs> I'm just very intimidating. Um, <laughs> yeah, just, dude, like, so, like no one screws around on my podcast. Yeah. So. <laughs> He's got a lot of beard, man. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say there's anything that's ever like gone off the rails. Uh, I mean, usually what would happen, what turns out is that, um, and I will not name names or anything like that, but just someone turns out to not be a very sparkling conversationalist. And the conversation is sort of like not interesting. I mean, like it, not interesting in a way that like I like I enjoyed the conversation with them because they were a good person. But the conversation would not really merit uh, putting out to other people or and typically and this is where it is. And, and I hate to say something like this is uh my foreign language skills are not great. And sometimes I will have somebody on who English is like their second or third language. Mm -hmm. And it would be a, it would be a disservice to them to put it out in a completely unedited format because it just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't cast them in the best light. And so I, I've had some interviews with themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's just like, oh, I can't put this out because people like, like this, this, the conversation is good, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be good for them. And so usually that's the only reason something doesn't air with me. Cause otherwise like the conversations are usually really good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. you are really great. And also you ask very thoughtful questions um, and that are actually tailored to the person rather Thank than you. kind of just like generic things. Um, and that's so funny because a lot of people in the comments were asking questions about, I was going to ask Eric if he can speak anything besides English, then mention that there's a podcast for people who want to learn Spanish on Audible. If you come on this show enough times, there will eventually be an Eric Taint in here. Eric, are you bilingual? Have you tried learning a language on your own? See, I there speak, are a lot of people really trying to. <laughs> I speak bank Spanish. I was a bank teller in Southern California for a couple of years. And mm. so I can I can count really well. Mm. Um, and I understand Fine. a lot. I understand a lot more Spanish than I speak. Um, so I get around really well in Spain and parts of South America and Mexico, but I, I, I can't respond as well. I just, but I understand a lot. Well, if you're ever looking for a new hobby in your free time, I highly recommend Duolingo and this is not a sponsor, but I'm currently addicted. Um, so, uh, it's a free app <laughs> and, uh, and <laughs> not a sponsor, but check out Duolingo. It's free, which is why they're not giving us money. Which is why they're not them. giving us money. Yeah, no, uh, Duolingo is awesome. And I'm currently on day 20 of Mandarin and having a blast. And oh, nice. Uh, yeah, it's a very good resource. And yeah, I think that if anyone's interested in learning another language, it's not it's it, there are definitely issues with it in that like it's not the one and only resource for becoming fluent in the language but i think when you're talking about 
doing nothing uh, when it comes yeah. to learning the language or something um it's gamified it so it's made it very fun and i'm oh, and i cool. enjoy competing in the leaderboards and trying to learn chinese faster than these people can learn english or spanish or japanese or whatever they're mm -hmm. learning so it's fun and it's fun going through the leaderboard and seeing what they're learning and i'm like my language is so much harder than you guys you're trying to learn <laughs> english <laughs> Um, now, uh, one time we had a dude on here who thought restaurants were leaving comments in his streams. <laughs> I know who you're talking about. Okay. We're going to move on from that one. Um, okay. Now, Eric, has there been one quote that stands out in your mind from someone who's been on the podcast that you go, that really changed my perspective on something in magic that really kind of elucidated something. And you were like, wow, like that person kind of blew my mind with something that they just said. Um, I, you know, I, I think a lot of people affect me in a lot of different ways. The, an early conversation I had with Carissa Hendricks on her meta modernity concept was really interesting. And then mm. there was another episode where she came back and she was talking about mana that was, was kind of fascinating to me. Whoa. Um, that's so fascinating. I have no idea what she even is referring to by mana. I know what she means like in a video game context or energy. It, it's very much, it's very much that in, mm. in that her, her character has to expend a certain amount of energy or mystical power in order to, and it can sort of like, it, it's, a, it's an interesting conversation, mm. an interesting topic. Um, I have, I, I've really enjoyed talking about failures with, uh, Eric Buss, mm. uh, cause I think Eric Buss is a really talented comedian as well as a magician. And so, and I find that a lot of comedians learn so much more from bombing than they do from having mm. great sets. Yeah. Uh, I think that, um, you know, there's, I, I don't know if there's any like quotes that really stand out that make mm, me go, yeah. Oh yeah. Like that's insane. That changed my yeah, life. Yeah. But I've had, I am definitely a better magician and a better person for hosting this podcast because mm. of some of the really fascinating conversations I've had. Um, I, I, I do have a, a special episode coming out probably in a few weeks that I think is going to be rather controversial. Mm. Um, I'm not going to say what it's about I'm or excited. who it is, uh, but it's, um, it's one that I've been hanging on to that I actually I, I recorded quite some time ago, but I uh, I knew that putting this out would make waves and I didn't want waves to be made before I competed at FISM. Uh, so it'll be mm -hmm. I think that one will be interesting and I think a lot of people will have a lot to say about it. Uh, but also like I've I've enjoyed talking to people who are considered controversial. Um, mm. pig, ca pig cake is a really interesting interview, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, it just because uh, he, he there was like, a reference earlier, uh, yeah. one time we had a dude on here who thought restaurants were leaving comments in his streams. That's <laughs> who we were talking about was Pig Cake. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. We uh, had him on the show. Definitely a controversial figure. Super yeah. controversial, but also like very aware of what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I would I would say that there are people who are controversial who are not terribly aware of what they're doing. Whereas mm -hmm. like Pig Cake has a very I don't know. He he's one of the few people who I'm I, I would say like he's really holding a mirror up to the magic community and like showing some of the ugly side of it um mm. in a in a really interesting way. And I, I kind of like what he's doing. Yeah. Um yeah. uh also uh Rick Lax and Justin Flom. I talked to them sort of uh mostly about Wizard Wars, um, mm. but about some other of like the early Facebook and YouTube stuff, not the stuff that they're doing now, mm. which was which was also a really interesting conversation, which made me sort of like have like, I don't know. So like Rick, I mean, because I was talking to Rick right around the time that like the, do you remember when he was doing the stuff where he would like put Red Bull and batteries in a dish and then he would put like a banana <laughs> yeah. in there? Yeah. And yeah, then yeah, it yeah. Would like, and you and I knew it was latex, but yeah. it like, or that it was like a special prop or like yeah. the fake hammer, um, but it wasn't presented that way. Yeah, and Rick's approach to those videos was pretty fascinating and mm. uh, and really interesting because it was just one of those where it was like, we all know in the magic community that this is fake, and we're like, this is dumb, this is not good. But like when you look at what he was trying to do with those, it actually was kind of. It was it was interesting because it was a very long form magic trick. Mm. Um, so I think I've had some controversial guests that I've gained some interesting perspective on mm. um, uh, as That's well. Cool. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, I mean, everyone's worth talking to. You know. Yeah, and I think that 
you and know, you don't the, have to agree with people either. Yeah. I think that's another thing is I think a lot of podcasts has tend to be very agreeable. And I, there's people I've challenged on on mm -hmm. different things. You know, we yeah. may not agree on stuff, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Stop. Stop. <laughs> um, no, I uh, I was I was sick and was using a PayPal Go uh, a type of cough syrup that's very popular in China and Hong Kong. And I was asking Lindsay about this type of cough syrup. Sorry, I'm seeing this whole debate that's going on in the comments. <laughs> I was not drinking cough syrup recreationally, guys. Uh, I was asking Lindsay about PayPal Go because I didn't realize that he spoke Chinese and stuff. And you guys should definitely check out his Twitch stream, Lindsay Harvey. He's hilarious. And uh, yeah, and very good insights. Also, if you happen to be trying to learn Mandarin. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think that that's definitely like so important because mm -hmm. anybody, regardless of if you disagree with them on a particular issue or not, has some kind of expertise in something and anyone oh, yeah. is worth listening to and learning from. And a lot of these people that might be very successful on social media that magicians go, oh, well, he doesn't know anywhere near as much about magic as I do. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, but he allocated his time to learning the business of that platform yep. and the algorithm of that platform and how to blow up. And so they're making content that will do well on that. And they at least are doing some magic and showing some magic. Also, I think that... Um, I think Eddie Izzard and Pat yeah. Oswald both have something to say on mm. controversial ideas. So mm. like Eddie Izzard, we're uh, talking about like religion is just yeah. a philosophy with some great ideas and some fucking weird ones is mm. such a good way to look at it. But also like Patton Oswalt has a joke, um, but it is also true, which is uh, where he talks about how um, you have to acknowledge people's ideas. You don't have to tolerate their ideas. You just have to, you, you can, you have to acknowledge that people have ideas. You don't have to accept that those ideas are good ideas. You just have to acknowledge that their ideas yeah. exist. Yeah. And, and, and I think that that's a, a good way to go through life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, Fiddle and Johnny, uh, how do I keep my beard so luscious? Do you have any products? I use, uh, the, the beard, uh, goop in Target that is for world champions, um, but you can't. World you, champion beard goop. It it is yes. Mm. Um, and it's not for clowns, as it says on the front of it. And Tom it's Crosby, Tom Crosby once walked up to me in a booth and correctly identified the brand of beard balm that I use just by scent alone, because wow. Tom Crosby is a witch. <laughs> Tom Crosby uh, is a witch. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's that. And then uh, when I'm going to be on camera uh, or on a stage that I that I think is important, I use a Revlon Volumizer Plus uh, beard or uh, Re Revlon Volumizer Plus uh, hair comb slash blow dryer to uh, round brush this. slash blow dryer. This yeah. is uh, very similar to what I use to style my lack of beard. Yep. However, that's what I use on the rest of my hair. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, no, I style not Revlon, but yeah, it blow dryer is a way yeah. to go. I, uh, I round brush with a blow dryer and I, I style my hair the same way that Blaze styles his hair. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. The more you know, the more you know. Now, uh, what is your favorite part of working for Penguin? Is it the teaching in some instructional things? Is it the uh, the fact that you get to talk about the different products and talk with different magicians from around the world on the podcast, be involved in the P3 shows? It's, I mean, it's it's changed over the years. Uh, I mean, it, it used to be just amazing to be around the most, you know, cutting edge magic products mm -hmm. in the world. I mean, you know, Penguin has yeah. the best stuff and there's a reason that people put stuff out with penguin and we're very good at making physical products mm -hmm. and we're very good at making cool videos. Uh, having the studio at my, you know, at my fingertips is really awesome. Um, it's a, uh, it's a fun place to work on new material. Mm -hmm. Hosting the lectures is good. It, it, it changes, you know, it changes on a day-to-day -day basis. It's like any other job. It has its own headaches. Um, and there's like, there's stuff that I could be like, Oh my God, this is so frustrating. Uh, but that's just cause like, this is my world every day. Yeah. Um, but that's the same way it is with, with any job. Uh, it's, it's hard to pin down what is the one thing that is like, that makes it incredible. Uh, but it's just, it's just all of it. I mean, just today I was working on a product uh, it's a John Bannon product. I can't tell you what it is yet, but I, uh, I filmed it with John Bannon. I'm in the tutorial with John Bannon. 
which is mm, really yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I'm performing John Bannon's effects for people, and then sessioning with John Bannon on his on his mm. trick, uh, which is, and then I get to edit that and make it look good and mm. uh, and make it you know cool and and fun and accessible and just like you know it's it's, it's pretty cool it's yeah, just it's it's awesome, really man. yeah yeah how okay so how does one who goes from a kid how old were you when you started magic uh i started kind of late in the game i mean like you know i had magic kits as a kid mm -hmm. i had a cups and balls set when i was 10 or 11 uh but i didn't really get serious about it till i was like 18 19 years old gotcha. okay so yeah. kind of similar kind of similar to me i think I, yeah. I i like started when i was nine or ten and mm -hmm. then really got in it like didn't focus on it for a while and got into it when i was more like 14 15 yeah um so how does one and this is something that i've had to go through my own journey with and things how does one, from your perspective, maintain that same kind of excitement and childlike, you know, um, inspiration from magic that where it's that relationship that you have when it's your hobby and it's this new thing? Mm -hmm. How do you maintain that excitement for it um, and not suffer, say, burnout when you fully immerse yourself in it and it becomes your entire life, your entire career, your job, and it's more than just your hobby? I think that if you want something to be your job, you should thoroughly enjoy a certain mm -hmm. aspect of it. Um, there are things that I hate doing at Penguin, and there are things I love doing at Penguin. Uh, when it comes to magic, one of the things that keeps me very excited is when I'm working on new pieces for my show. You know, in addition mm -hmm. to doing all this fun stuff with Penguin, uh, you know, teaching and stuff like that, I still love performing. Uh, there's a handful of, country, of theaters I perform at across the United States, and I love going to those theaters and running my show there. Mm. And, you know, it's it, one the one thing that Penguin affords me is that I don't have to hunt down the next corporate gig. I don't have to get a performing arts center to agree to put my show up. I don't have to be super commercial. I can do the show that I want. Now, mm. I, I choose to be commercial, so those theaters will book me again and again and again. Um, but that's it allows me to have a, a freedom with my show that I think a lot of other performers don't get. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm always working on something for that show that I want. Like my card to pocket is really good. Um, I, I mean, I not to toot my own horn too much, but people were getting out of my show at the Magic Castle and immediately getting in line to go see it again, mm. not because of the FISM Act, but because of the card to pocket. They were mm. like, they were deeply fooled. It's super entertaining. Mm. It's a lot of fun for me to do uh, because it, it has the slights that I like messing with. It's mm. got principles that I like screwing around with. Uh, I really like the presentation that I've come up with and yeah. uh, the misdirection moments. I mean, like I feel like a god when I perform that particular effect. I mean, it is arguably some of the strongest magic I've done in years. And uh, and there is no drug better than doing that. Mm. Um, and so I will do that anytime I can. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, I mean, I think, but I think that it gets back to do like finding the thing that you love the most and, you know, wanting to be a full-time professional magician and then finding out what it's like being a full-time professional magician may make you go, mm -hmm. I need to get a job in IT. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and sometimes that's not a bad thing at all because totally and it's definitely not, and I'm not even to say sometimes it's not a bad thing. Maybe the majority of the time it's not a bad thing because if that is what it takes for you to maintain the same relationship with your hobby yeah. and what your passion, sometimes your avocation does not need to become your vocation. You know, yeah. you can, keep it as your love and 100%. not abuse it and need it need to milk it for your ability to survive. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that's, I think that's something that is really important to get to some of the best magicians in the world. Some of your heroes that you think of where you're like, Oh man, I can't wait to get their next product. I can't wait to get their next book are not full-time magicians. And that mm. is just something, I think that's the something that you mentioned like, Rick Merrill earlier. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> won the Grand Prix first try, and he's like, "Yeah, I'll just go back, back to my to, regular job." <laughs> went back to being a sales guy. I mean, yeah. you know, John Bannon, who was arguably one of the most influential card magicians, especially in the world of packet tricks, in the last fifty years, 
uh, who has written some of the most influential magic books around, was a lawyer for a long time mm. and doesn't do professional magic. And I interviewed him about that once, and he was like, I'm a passionate amateur. Now that he's retired, he's doing a lot more with it. But mm. but for years, it was just, I mean, that was that was the way he was. You know, and it was this, and it's the same with a lot of people. And I think that um, I think we get hung up on this idea that being a working pro is the most important thing and that it's like a, it's a badge of honor mm. and it's really not doing good magic is a badge of honor. I mean, you know, I just competed at FISM and, you know, I'm sure half of those cats who were perform who were competing were not full time pros. That was mm. just something that they created because they love to do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's that that's it really it's up to you to to maintain your relationship with magic and mm. and there's and and no one else can dictate your relationship with magic and so yeah. sometimes making it not your vocation is the best way to do that when you said no one can dictate your relationship with magic do yep. you feel that there is a side to the community that mm -hmm. tries to dictate people's yes. relationship with magic 100 percent. it's always been that way mm -hmm. uh Great. i can't tell you how many times i've gone to lecture to ibm ring or an sam assembly and someone will say how do you how do you communicate to the young people who are here that this is magic and this isn't magic and mm. um i i have to tell them yeah, this is a fundamental problem in the question i mean like yeah i mean like so and they're asking that question in two different ways one is like well doing apps on your phone isn't real magic i defy you to find anyone that i've performed our digit for and mm. it, i mean they will they'll swear up and down that our digit is one of the coolest things they've ever seen in their entire mm. life versus some of the card tricks that i can do and i'm no mm. slouch with a deck of cards our digit is super magical um cannot highly cannot recommend an app higher than our digit it's really mm. good uh, but the other thing they're talking about is like doing magic for Instagram or TikTok or something like that. Well, yeah. I mean, it's a new venue, you know, and there was a lot of people who l rather loudly proclaimed that doing magic on YouTube and Instagram was bullshit. And then we're right along in the trenches with everybody else doing virtual shows mm -hmm. when the yeah. pandemic hit. Um, no one can dictate your relationship with magic. And, it, yeah. and as long as you are not hurting other people or yourself um it's it's uh you can't really dictate that now that being said there are some general rules that the community agrees uh, that was going to be my next question yeah i think now uh, that sort of comes back to if you want to engage with the magic community and you uh at all there are some things that we all kind of generally agree upon don't expose stuff make sure you practice don't hurt animals you know don't steal material. Mm -hmm. uh, th I mean, these are sort of general rules, right? Yeah. But that's just, that's part of living in a society, right? Yeah. Whereas what I, what I mean is that like, sort of like artistically, like your relationship yeah. with magic, like somebody can't be like, oh, well, don't do card tricks because lay people don't like card tricks. Screw you. Yeah. I almost yeah. do exclusively card tricks, mm -hmm. you know, or like mentalism sucks. I don't like most mentalists, right? But like, if you love mentalism, don't let that stop you. Right. If you yeah. love doing tricks on Instagram, if you hate performing for people and all you like doing is just inventing sick gimmicks, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Do that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's yeah. what I mean. I mean. I think that. Yeah, I, I, I think that the magic community is better for having someone like Kalen in it, even though he's not the kind of guy who's doing shows necessarily. He's coming up with a lot of things that so many 100%. people who are the kind of people to do shows are really lucky to have in their repertoire. So Nicholas Lawrence, another yeah. really good example, right? Yeah, I yeah. love the stuff Nicholas comes up with and he'll tell you yeah. he, that he doesn't really perform, you know, he'll do yeah. stuff out, you know, and about with a couple yeah, of people, from not like, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But he's not gigging and that doesn't matter. He creates amazing stuff. Yeah. I mean, I love Nicholas. Every time Nicholas comes out with something, have you seen Hornet? Like that thing looks like I haven't a miracle. Seen it, no, I just, I saw a video of it on Instagram today. It looked awesome. Um, that's, yeah. I mean, that at the end of the day, like it's, everybody is contributing to magic in a different way. Right. I mean, the only thing that, I mean, like, a, you're not going to hurt magic, right? Mm -hmm. Magic's been around for 3,000 years, right? Yeah. It can survive somebody doing something stupid, right? Yeah. Um, I, the, the only thing that I just, I get concerned about is that, that like, you know, when people are like, because I, I say you, no one can dictate your relationship with magic, but I do caveat that with, 
if you want to have a relationship with the magic community, you need to mm. understand that the magic community has got rules that everyone yeah. sort of generally agrees everyone, upon. You've got to yeah. abide by. So that's that is kind of where it is. Now, what those rules are does get sticky and is squishy. Yeah. But yeah, so totally. And it's it's crazy when you go to things like Magic Live and then you realize mm -hmm. just how small our community is, or you or plays like Fism, so tiny. like what yeah. you, you know, and it's like it is it is very unique and special that we're part of it, this art form that uh, that is able to be so tight knit and that mm -hmm. anyone is accessible really in this art form, you know, like, uh, you know, in, a lot of people in Vegas are like one degree of separation away from someone like Copperfield, you know, it's yep. like, you'd probably no Chris, you know, it's uh, everyone is connected. Or a lot of people have just met Copperfield at the at the at Magic Live itself. You know, yep. it's like you can meet anyone in the community, and that's something really, really special. You know, you couldn't think of that in terms of music or or whatever. Um, oh, yeah. But I do think that there is there is kind of a level of elitism, and sometimes it kind of gets manifested in funny ways or silly ways. Like I, I've I've definitely heard of people um, telling younger magicians that before they can begin to create their own magic, they need to learn, you know, a, a lot of, you know, they need to learn all the yeah. history. And it's like, well, that's impossible because of, it's 3000 years of history. And you could, even if you were to relegate it to just cards, you could spend the entire rest of your life just learning card tricks that have been published and you'd still never, ever start creating. I think that without naming names or pointing fingers um mm. and particularly because i used to be one of these people mm. that there are a lot of people who had rose petals thrown at their feet who think that rose petals should continue to be thrown at their feet mm. and that they think that they are god's gift to magic and as a result they treat other people in a way that is not wonderful uh yeah. it, should i say um and I uh, I was definitely not a good person when I was younger and definitely thought that people should have treated me better than I than you know that I was you know and it took me a lot of really hard self reflection to understand you know a what my relationship with magic was and what I wanted my magic my relationship with the magic community to be and mm. I have endeavored to be a better person and be mm. a better role model and just be a a, just a, a nice person to hang out with an enjoyable person to hang out with. And that is something that I want for myself. Cause I was not always that way. Mm -hmm. And, and magic is weird in that if you get, if you get notoriety, it's very easy to sort of like puff yourself up and start dictating, mm -hmm. uh, what you think magic should be to other people. Mm -hmm. And I think the people who are the best magicians are the ones who don't do that, who are just like, mm -hmm. yep, here's my ideas. You can do whatever you want. I think this is cool. This is just the way I want to do it. Yeah, it is a tough thing. I mean, when you mentioned rose petals being thrown at your feet, not and that, uh, and also, yeah, good for you, Eric. Like, uh, like what Lindsay was saying, like that's awesome that you had that kind of you know journey within yourself, you know, and uh, and it's tough to have that journey within yourself because there are a lot of role models and people that are praised in magic that do have a bit of an elitist air to them that, and so it wouldn't. It's not surprising that you would imitate that. You know, um, but um, yeah, but that's when you're not about, yeah. that's not unique to magic, though. That's yeah, happens, it's anything. Yeah, it happens in any sort yeah. of creative endeavor. There's yeah. always people who think like, oh, there's always gatekeeping yeah. is bullshit mm -hmm. and we should just stop it. Um, yeah. I understand why people want to do it, but ultimately it doesn't really help anything. It just makes yeah. some people feel better. Yeah, and and the thing I was just gonna get at was just like with, when you mentioned rose petals being thrown at your feet, it's it's almost like rose petals are inherently thrown at your feet prior to your entrance to the magic community. Because mm -hmm. if you enter the magic community, that means that you've reached a level of interest in magic itself that you felt like you needed to dive deeper and mm -hmm. try and meet other magicians. So that means that you already probably had rose petals thrown at your feet by the layman around you, the non-magicians yep. that you grew up around. I hate using the word layman, but like mm -hmm. the non-magicians that you grew up around that were freaked out when you got to show them tricks. So it's almost oh, yeah. like you could have been that socially awkward freshman in high school and now you can do magic and now you feel like a senior. You feel like the top of the world. And 100%. then you're like, I want to go and meet other magicians who are like-minded or mm -hmm. I want to learn the best tricks. So I'm going to go join the magic community. And then you realize the one thing that made you super special is not special in a group of your peers. 
Yeah. And then I feel like that's where a lot of people have this kind of mental disconnect where they're like, I need, I need to preserve this ego I've just built mm. up where I feel the top of the world by, and you can either do that by trying to just get as good as you can and improve yourself like you did, or you can try and put other people down. My favorite thing that happens when I have anyone who's even remotely controversial on the podcast is when it's, it, it always happens when it's someone who teaches magic on YouTube. Mm. And uh, I will invariably get an avalanche of emails where they're like, you should know that there's a lot of people who think this person is hurting magic because they teach magic on YouTube. And it's this weird gatekeeping thing where it's just mm. like they don't like they're they 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 think that they this person has invalidated basically their entire career because mm. they have taught a trick on on YouTube, not not ex not just randomly exposed it, mm -hmm. uh, but like, but but actively made a tutorial on uh, on YouTube, and it's it's just another yeah. one of those times where it's like you're you're missing what this person is doing. You're missing that this person is actively caring for magic in like mm -hmm. a specific way, yeah. uh, and it, it's just it's just really interesting to me that kind of like vitriol that comes out. Uh, in in the community, and it just needs to stop. So, <laughs> just needs to stop. Yeah. yeah, just needs to stop. And I have heard a certain magician <laughs> um, interview another magician, and I remember this person saying to that other magician like oh but don't you feel like there needs to be like more kind of barrier to entry like mm -hmm. the, you know uh, for people to not have access to the secrets or whatever and i was like no not at all yeah it, the the secrets are accessible and i think that the the uh you know the idea of trying to preserve them more is just not understanding that the internet exists you know it's it's going to happen anyway so it might be yeah. it might be done well by people who actually care about it rather than you know people who don't Presenting the information in an in a in a good way is the most important thing. Like mm -hmm. presenting it in a way that that actively educates somebody in a good way is the most important thing. Hiding, you know, now it is that is not to say that everything should be taught on YouTube. I mean, like I wouldn't have a job if that was the way it is. Like there's definitely some secrets that we should have a higher barrier to entry. And I think magic is very fascinating from an intellectual property standpoint. Mm -hmm. Because and I just found this out recently, the intellectual property lawyers actually study magic because we're one of the only intellectual property groups that self police, and mm. we've got different and we've got different rules than other people, um, uh, as far as all, a lot of that stuff goes. But uh, could you the, elaborate on that a little bit? I know uh, you have a point you're getting to, but yeah. Well, no, I, uh, no, I can't for other reasons. But um, uh, what what I think is interesting is that like deciding where something can be taught and can't be taught on YouTube, especially like in, in terms of like card magic is really mm. fascinating, right? Mm. Like, where is it yours? And, and, and uh, where is like, how does that stuff get taught? I, you know, mentalism secrets are really fascinating too. Like if it's in a library book, like, uh, like how is YouTube different than a library, which is really interesting. Mm, yeah. What, what I would, what I meant for the elaborating wasn't on what they're doing that group in particular or mm -hmm. lawyers or anything. I just meant, what would you say are the ways in which we as a community self police? Oh, just like anytime. Um, eh, let's talk about something else. Uh, this, okay. this is, this is better. This is different, uh, different talk about uh, for different things. Yeah, no, it's just, okay. uh, I actually had a really interesting, if you want to hear more about it and it's just because I'm a little, I can't, put into words the way this is i did a podcast with sarah crassen about okay. intellectual property rights in magic which was really fascinating because mm. she she's done she spoke at genie this i kind of where i was going was was the interview that i did with sarah crassen about that mm. um and sarah crassen has some really interesting things to talk about with that gotcha and another note bill wants to know how are people going to worship me if they know what a pinky break is <laughs> I have this no is a idea. serious this is a serious problem yeah um Okay, so then into the weeds more on that. Yeah. What what do you feel is the value of secrecy in magic? Oh, the value of secrecy? Oh, in modern magic. 
That is interesting. Um, because the dirty little secret magic is that like anything you any any secret you want to learn costs like fifty bucks, right? I mm -hmm. mean, like about fifty bucks. Yeah. I mean, like how many things have you seen on AGT or Fool Us that are just products now, which mm -hmm. is really cool. Um, I think secrecy is one of those things that we guard it very jealously. Um, because we were told to, mm. right? But you see, uh, you know, like if you just tell somebody the secret immediately at a magic show, it makes it not fun anymore. Mm. Um, but the, the but we're very open with sharing secrets with each other, like like at like you know Magic Live or something like that. It's mm. uh, I, man, that's a tough question. I don't I don't know how to answer that. I um. I, I'm very open with people. Yeah. And I let the conversation go there. And I don't, I feel as though because I don't create any barrier to secrets with my audience, they create them themselves. And what I mean is that if anyone wants to know how anything that I do is done, I'm willing to talk with them about it. And by being willing mm -hmm. to begin that conversation, they'll usually stop me and say, no, 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 no. I don't want to know mm -hmm. before I even get into it. And I think then that's probably preserve. true. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I think people will generally like tell you that they don't want to know and, and, and not do that. But I think that also like, I don't think people, I think most people don't really want to know how it works. Mm hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I think most people don't. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. Like the, even the people who say that they do. They don't, don't. really want to know because they know that the secrets are always disappointing. Yeah. They know the secrets are always disappointing, right? Like the, the way my card tricks work is always disappointing because it's always that I just palmed it. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh yeah, yeah. Like if you were to, if you were to boil things down to like the the simplest explanation, then yes, like yes, yeah. No. Because the simplest explanation is always I just palmed it. Because if you if you get any of my products, the answer is always Eric just palmed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Every, everything I teach is just like it's like you. It's like all of your products are just he got it out of the middle with one hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> At least so far. Yeah, that's pretty much uh that's pretty much it. And so yeah, it's like if people really care, then they can they can certainly uh you yeah. know, they can certainly look it up. Um if people know about the market of magic, is that detrimental? <laughs> it's kind of an interesting thing that like, you I don't know, think it is. I, I don't think, think it's how we create new yeah. I think it's how we create new magicians these days. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. I think like us and a lot of the other like big magic companies are always like running advertisements on Facebook and the algorithm is very smart. Mm. And if you are looking stuff up that is magic related, it'll start feeding those to you. And then you might go, oh, I want to do magic. And so you'll go out and get a new card trick or coin trick or, you know, maybe your very first digital download. And then you'll learn a trick or two and uh, and then you'll you'll get into it and you, you might like learn something that you want to like makes you want to become a magician. Mm, yeah, totally. And, yeah. and I think more magicians is a good thing rather than less. hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. The more magicians we have, the better. I think that, uh, you know, I, I want, I want more magic meetings here in Columbus. I want more magic clubs and more magic groups because the more magicians there are, the better the community is. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So we had a question a while back that was on that on that point and i was holding off on on uh, answering it because i had a feeling that we were going to get there but mm -hmm. um uh a few weeks ago and i don't know if we were saying that this should be the case but we were bringing up the the topic so tigger t brought this up like an hour ago uh a few oh, weeks yeah, ago yeah. and ryan were talking about how fizz at fizz and the audience shouldn't be just magicians mostly because they have an idea of how things are done what was the experience like for you that wasn't exactly what the point was we were saying oh. that we felt like it would be more beneficial to the performers if there was a non-magician presence that way people could gauge the act the audience reaction well, so um, it, it, and have fizzum, that they feedback at FISM, they had like designated lay people for this for the uh, magicians who wanted. Uh, so there was a woman who was at the table with me who was uh, not a magician. She actually turned out to be a journalist for National Geographic. Oh wow! 
Uh, so she was like definitely not a magician, knew nothing yeah. about it. Um, whereas, you know, they also have magicians who are like enthusiastic lay people. Like Sean Farquhar mm -hmm. is a great yeah. audience, no matter like for whatever. The, and Mark D'Souza is another one who's just like a great audience member. Uh, yeah. But they do have designated lay people there for like the magicians to perform to. Um, but also like FISM as a competition exists for magicians to do magic for magicians. Mm -hmm. So I think that like there should definitely be magic competitions that are just like only like the lay people or the judges, right? I mean, that's essentially yeah. what America's Got Talent is. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 so what were some of the, no, it was all magician judges. Yeah. It's all, it's all yeah. magician judges, but like, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I think that we were talking about like just the crowd response as well is that if you had, even like a significant portion of the audience that's able to watch that was not uh, that were not magicians oh, yeah. it would impact the reaction and the feedback that the performer gets and then you would actually get to see that performer and what the reactions are like when they're performing for non-magicians and i feel like that oh, might yeah. enhance the experience in the room um yeah. yeah yeah i you know they sold um public tickets for all of the gala shows so like mm. you know people from quebec could go to the gala show but I, but they didn't do that for the competitions. And I, that would have definitely been like, it would have been a very different experience if there was like, you know, 500 lay people in there along with a thousand magicians. Like it would have been a very wild experience to see, to see that. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I think that by through social media and things, do you feel as though audiences over time will in general shift to being slightly closer to a FISM audience in that they'll have seen more magic online. So they end up with a context for what is good and bad magic, or at least in their opinion, they end up with a sub subjective framework for like, this is magic that I like, and this is magic that clearly must be more difficult. You know, um, if people have a little bit of insight into magic, just of some of the fundamentals, do you think that improves their appreciation as an audience member? I do. And the, I think that we have, uh, I think we have a, already a case study that indicates that yes, this is, mm -hmm. that is what will happen. And the case study is Spain. Mm. Um, uh, so I thought you were going to say the case study was TikTok. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so Juan Tamarez has basically been a part of Spanish culture for the last 30 or 40 years mm. and as a result of that spain treats magic differently than mm. other people like not just their magicians but like when you do magic for people in spain they like already have an awareness of like what good magic should be because mm. juan was doing like you know oil and water on tv 20 25 yeah. years ago mm. so it's just like the Whenever when when I was in Spain a number of years ago and performing magic for people, it felt different. Like I could do things that that I in Spain that I couldn't do in the U.S. And it, it was just because that mm. they had they had a different magical vernacular uh, than other people. Yeah. Do you think that it would be better if audiences were more like Spanish audiences? Then. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, like, I, you know, it, it just, basically the difference was you could do a plot that other that only magicians would normally be interested in. So, like, card at number is kind of an interesting thing that is mm. like, I don't know how many how many card at number products have come out in the last number of years, and it's like this is the best card at number. Yeah, but like when you do card at number card at number for people, like it doesn't have the same impact as card to impossible location, right? Because a card appearing at a, a named card appearing at a specified number, like you have to kind of explain to an audience why that is amazing. Right? I know right. it. Well, I disagree. It depends on the presentation. Well, I, that's that, well, but yeah. that the presentation is what explains to them why this is so impressive. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. And what I'm Whereas saying is that you're describing a, you're describing a magic effect. Whereas I think that, card any number in its best light is not a magic effect so i think that personally i think that it's but yeah i get what you're i don't want to yeah. interrupt your thought but i think that i this is also something i'd like to get in the weeds on no i'm i'm all for getting in the weeds on it because i think that fundamentally something dematerializing from one place and rematerializing in another is 
easier for a lay audience to wrap their head around and to be to, for it to be impossible. Whereas a something like oil and water or card at number is a more nuanced plot that requires a good presentation for them to have a have a real experience mm -hmm. around because there because i could go out and do mm -hmm. a card at number for them that was just like dead nuts simple easy to do you know it was just me second dealing and i've got a pretty good second deal but if i just did it okay like it's one thing right but if a card vanishes and then reappears somewhere else and it's got their signature on it mm -hmm. like that that's is more overtly impossible yeah and i'm not saying that's a better trick I'm saying it's easy. It's easier for an audience that is not as magically educated. I think is the terminology I'm going to go with mm. there. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, no, that makes sense. Exactly. Yeah, I yeah. think that's what I mean. Um. It's not that yeah. it's. It's not that it's better or worse. It's just different, and it's. It, it's you know, you're having to you're having to think for a different audience. Mm, definitely. Yeah. The the whole thing with Aiken. Um, is just that I, I don't, well, there are so many different ways to present it. Mm -hmm. And there's so many ways to present it that I don't personally like. And yeah. I don't put card at any number in the same category as card to an impossible location, because I feel that I get a lot more strength out of it not being presented as magic as in like this card is dematerializing from one mm. place in the deck and rematerializing in a, at another place in the deck i don't i don't ever claim that there's been a moment where something has changed location rather it's more that it is inevitable and my like I, i've also been playing with recently um it, my whole set like what i do at speakeasy at magic every week is like a 15 minute set um and the the o I only have one moment that I would call magic and it's mm -hmm. the very last thing because I feel that I establish a set of rules throughout my presentation and now I can I break them at the very last moment so that right. way I leave them with more questions than answers as I as I walk away but that the there is a card in any number moment during the routine but the premise that I have is that I as I sit down at the table, I say, this isn't exactly like a choreographed pick a card, you find it kind mm -hmm. of thing. This is more mm -hmm. like for the next 10, 15 minutes, whatever you say will be. So don't mm -hmm. make your decisions too lightly. And so now the audience feels that I've placed a card at this one place in the deck. And the difficult mm -hmm. part for me is that I'm trying to influence them to think of the card and exactly where I put it. And so then the idea is like, they know that it's going to be there and this inevitability and the fact that I'm confident in the inevitability is the only thing that makes it crazy or remotely astonishing. But mm -hmm. I feel like that elevates it personally to a premise that's believable. And then because it's believable, it's unbelievable. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. It just, it sort of comes down to like when the you're presenting a men, yeah. well, it, when you're presenting a mentalism routine, but you're not doing it as a mentalism routine, Mm -hmm. uh or i mean like i straight up tell my audience that what i do isn't magic i tell them mm -hmm. what i do is a demonstration of skill for which they have mm -hmm. no explanation mm -hmm. um i mean that that everything we're doing is 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 real but not magic if that makes yeah. sense um now that, i mean that's what that's the weird justification that i need to do to myself to make it good yeah. uh but i think what you're getting towards though is that like that that approach and that premise or that presentational style is what pleases you and that mm -hmm. because it pleases you so deeply it makes it in it makes it deeply interesting to a lay audience that's a that's a very interesting point yeah and also like if i feel like audiences can sense when you have put a piece of yourself into a routine and when yeah. it is yours by the way that you carry yourself mm -hmm. um and that feeling <laughs> forces me to feel like I need to be performing material that's my own. And I yeah. imagine that you probably feel something similar. I mean, yes. I also, um, I quite like performing other people's material. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily their presentations, but I like performing other people's magic. Because I don't think of myself mm -hmm. as, a fair, as a terribly good creator. I think that I'm pretty good at coming up with presentations and, and making strong performance pieces. 
you know, like one of my favorite things to perform these days is Flight 101 by Roddy McGee. Now that is, that's an amazing trick. Borrowed ring appears on borrowed spectator's keys. I mean, mm. no reels, solid state. The ring's never in danger. Yeah. Uh, it's a great piece of magic. Um, and there's no way I could have come up with that gimmick. Um, but performing it for people, I get mm. monster reactions. Um, but like, you know, but in general, I don't like ring flight. I think mm. ring flight is like not a great trick. Um, uh, for a lot of reasons that are like very magician y, um, mm. even though a borrowed object to an impossible location is a very strong idea. Mm. Um, but yeah, I like, but I do like performing other people's stuff. I think it just mm. comes down to like wanting to give them a, a really good experience of just like of magic, of astonishment. Mm. Um, yeah. Even if that astonishment is they know that I did something specifically, it's just impossible for them to understand how anyone could get to the point where they could actually mm. do that. Um, I mean, like, you know, I do. Uh, I have a handling of the Mayhew poker deal. Have you ever done the Mayhew poker deal before? Like Chris Mayhew? Uh, no, Steve Mayhew. No, I'm not familiar. So it's you tell the story of the of the center deal. And then mm. you take about 10 or 15 cards and you shuffle them face up into the deck okay. so that they're spread throughout. And then you say you're going to center deal those cards out of the deck. And then you do, and they come out in rapid succession, mm. right? So it's like one after the other. Mm. And it is, it is a, an interesting approach to triumph because mm. that's what you're essentially doing is sorting the deck. B it's an interesting gambling presentation because you are, telling somebody about something that they think is possible and then mm. you're showing them what it would look like if you could do it perfectly mm. and then b it's kind of a big old bluff because yeah. there's a lot of different handlings to it but you're not actually doing a center deal you're doing without getting too deep into the method you're doing mm. a second deal yeah um because it's almost impossible to deal from the center in rapid succession one after another from 25 or 15 different places yeah you're yeah. not holding a break you're holding, <laughs> yeah yeah so it it but it gives this impression that you can do something impossible right it's not magic though mm. right what you're doing is not magic what you're doing is demonstrating something that's impossible and the when they look at that and if you convince them that you really did deal from the center it it almost gets a stronger and deeper moment of astonishment mm. than something like producing a signed card inside of a block of mm. ice that you pulled out of somebody's hat like Malini or something like mm. that but it's yeah. but it's a different but it is a different way of sharing that moment and that experience with somebody mm. yeah and there is astonishment evoked from awe at someone's ability yeah. And then there is astonishment evoked from an ability that you cannot conceptualize. Yes. You know, so I, I think that that's, that's very interesting is like, you know, regardless of the thoughts on the person, if you, th I, I, I look back at videos of Michael Jackson's performances and I'm like, mm -hmm. he evoked more astonishment from his audiences than maybe any magician ever, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then it gets into what differentiates magic from theater in terms of if, if the thing that differentiates magic from other types of theater is that we evoke astonishment, you know, as the primary emotion, then what happens in that case where there is this, you know, performer that is so exceptional or that, or that their ability that it feels magical to behold them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what is the difference between us and, and say other art forms? I don't know that I could tell you what the difference is because on some level I'm inclined to say magic and theater are not necessarily different. It's mm. just that they have different goals, mm. um, that they're basically the same thing, but with different, different goals in mind of the reaction from their audience. And I couldn't, I'm not sure, you know, I, I've heard so many times people talk about, oh, my favorite definition of magic is Max Maven's definition, which was something that took him a long time to get to. And I couldn't even tell you off the top of my head what Max Maven's definition of magic is. I just know that it's very well considered and very good. Um, but I don't necessarily know that what I do 
would also follow other people's definition of magic. Mm. And I'm not sure that I necessarily want to do what other people's mm. definition of magic is. Yeah. Um, Cause I think that that it sort of gets back to that thing that I said earlier is that you can't really dictate anyone else's relationship with magic. Um, and so you can't really dictate uh, like I have struggle putting it. I struggle putting into words like what, what it is that I do. Mm. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, because you're also claiming to be a sleight of hand artist, right? You're claiming to be someone who's capable of of sleight of yeah. hand feats. Yeah. So, yeah. So then people know yeah. before they're getting into it, which is also yeah. a wonderful way to present to present yourself, I believe, because mm -hmm. um because then the immediate explanation of sleight of hand, you mm -hmm. are already dispelling. You're saying, I know that this is sleight of hand. <laughs> yeah, but then at the same, like I do all that, but then at the same time, I performed Dan Harlan's The Awakening, which mm. is the single most magical piece of rope magic that I've mm. ever seen in my entire life. And sleight of hand doesn't even begin to explain how that thing could possibly work. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, so then it's a it's, whole other world. Yeah, it's just, it's like, I, I, you know, I, I claim something, but also, I'm not. I'm not really telling the truth about. It. I don't know. A critic once t said that I was refreshingly honest about my dishonesty, um, mm. which I think is probably the only true thing you could say about anything that I'm doing. Is that <laughs> even while I'm setting up these frameworks that I'm trying to operate inside, if I see something really cool and really shiny, I will just go do it and mm. da damn the frameworks that I set up. <laughs> okay, which is interesting, but. Um... Uh, no, Tigger, I'm not slowly getting off screen. I'm just relaxing. Um, but that, that's that's something that, that I've been thinking about a lot recently is when you create a framework mm -hmm. and you then want to break that framework, how do you structure the set so that you can not diminish the strength of the, the things that follow? So for, for example, Let's say that you are interested in doing a whole mentalism act and there are a lot of pre written predictions, a mm -hmm. confabulation of sorts or something, something that's been an envelope or whatever here the whole time, whatever. And then you go, I really want to demonstrate my color changes. So mm -hmm. I'm going to throw a bunch of color changes of me just transforming cards right at the very beginning of the set. Well, now you've just demonstrated an ability to change ink. So now the framework of trying to build up the idea that whatever is in that envelope was actually predicted before the show and you don't you haven't just changed the ink in the moment to whatever they said now is much more difficult. So I almost feel like you have to kind of choose when to break those rules. And it's not about never breaking the rules. It's just maybe yeah. you do it after you've already established a framework and the audience has understood what those rules are instead of breaking them and then trying to rebuild them later. So I'm curious your thoughts on that. Well, I think that uh, so in the example that you gave, I think that a you 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 know, the, the old adage of you have to learn what the rules are before you can break them is very important. But it's mm -hmm. it's not just learning what the rules are. It's learning why you have the rules to begin with, mm -hmm. because you can't because just breaking rules for the sake of breaking rules is bullshit. Mm -hmm. Right. That's like when you argue with somebody and, and then it just turns out that like, you know, the person who's like always like playing the devil's advocate. And then it's just like, well, mm -hmm. you just don't want the rules to apply to you, which is why you yeah. keep having these logical fallacies. Uh, in your argument process. Mm. Um, but what you're talking about is you, I think you have to make the keen observation. Will my audience recognize these rules? Mm. Right. Um, because in the example that you just gave uh, of you have all these written predictions, you want to do this and then you do a bunch of color changes. I don't think that most audiences will make the leap to he can change the ink. I think what they might make the leap to is that he is really good at switching stuff. Mm -hmm. And so the way to combat that is to make the reveals extremely clean. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. So that like other people are opening it. So there's no way you could do that. Um, and then the, the second thing is uh, your writing in transitioning from your clean predictions that are all over the place Two, I'm going to do a bunch of color changes has to be justified. Mm -hmm. You have to get either there is magic is very linear and you have to mm -hmm. do a to get to B to get to C and you can't just do a and then C. Yeah. Right. 
And so if you if you don't have that connective tissue that explains why you're doing this in the show, then it's it's not that you have broken your framework for a point. It's that you never it's that there was another piece of framework that you didn't understand and you mm. broke rules without understanding why those rules were there. Mm. So, I mean, that's that that is very specific to the yeah. example that you gave, which yeah. is also unlikely to happen. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you if you are a capable and competent performer. Um, but but mm. I think but it's I think it comes back to understanding why the rules need to be there. And then also asking yourself and then also being very honest with yourself and saying, well, if I'm doing all of these, these predictions over here, we all gen and we don't want to ruin the power of that. Why do I feel so strongly that I need mm -hmm. to do this as well? Yeah. And, and answering those questions. Yeah. And I feel like that it, looking at the act as a whole and the, the, you know, the show as a whole it is very beneficial for that. Um, and I, I think that, it's interesting. Like I usually approach coming up with things very much from a top down approach of like starting with the concept of the show and then the narrative and the character and then choosing magic moments and either creating or curating magic moments that then allow me to illustrate the, you know, the narrative moments. Um, but when you're coming from a competition perspective, you're spending years honing in on a particular act. So how do you juxtapose those two modes of thought of being a performing magician wanting to do shows and have a cohesive, say, hour long show that, you know, feels put together and also spending your time focusing on all of the minute details of one, say, five, 10 minute piece? Uh, the same way I juxtapose the fact that I uh, need to study and practice magic, but I also really enjoy playing Fortnite and spend <laughs> hours and hours playing Fortnite. I mean, it's, you know, yeah, just have, time, management. Have, uh, time management and I have varied and I have many and varied interests and mm -hmm. uh, and that and I, I allocate my time accordingly. Mm -hmm. So for you, they're just, they're just two totally different modes of thought then. Yeah, like I don't, you know doing my competition piece inside of my regular performing show, usually there is a framework of, all right, you heard, you heard me introduced as this crazy award-winning performer. You probably want to see why I've won these awards. Let's take a break from doing the rest of this to have, to set up the artificial construct of a competition uh, and then okay. show you that piece. Gotcha. Okay. So you present it as this is my competition act. And yes. so let me, you know, do it as if I was competing. I see. There, there are versions of my FISM act that live inside of another act, mm. but they are missing certain elements that are integral to the competition piece. Mm. Because like, so for example, the competition piece has to start from a sealed deck. Mm. And the reason it has to start from a sealed deck is so that the magicians all know that what I'm doing is with an ungaffed brand new deck of cards. Mm. That doesn't matter if the piece is inside of the middle of a show, mm. unless I am specifically separating out because I need to work on it in front of a live audience for competition purposes. And so that part can go away, which can also mean that other elements of it don't need to be there. Um, mm -hmm. But that only that, trick that piece only goes into the show if it makes sense in concert with everything else that is inside the show makes sense yes absolutely how much of your show would you say is flexible and you can do impromptu moments and how much of your show would you say is pretty much set in stone and the same every time less and less of it is um less and less of it is flexible mm. um there is uh there's stuff in the show that like you know things happen people say things i have conversations with people and uh they say things and that causes me to pick up on different things that i'll do callbacks to and so like i may like the joke the some of the scripting will change because that's just the nature of like live performance um but the actual like things that happen in my show, like all of that is planned. Even things mm -hmm. that look like they're unplanned are planned. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, I mean, there's, 
there's a thing that happens in my competition act that I also do in my main show, which is where my glasses fall apart. Mm. And when my glasses fall apart, people believe that an accident really happened. Mm. And that is there to show that I'm human. Mm. Um, and, and it's really important for that, for, for them to understand that. Uh, and I have worked very hard on being surprised every time my glasses fall apart, even mm-hmm. though my glasses have fallen apart thousands of times. <laughs> um, because the magician in trouble plot is not interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and it never has stakes. Um, mm-hmm. It needs to have stakes if, yeah. it's, if it's to be used effectively. And so uh, it occupies the glasses falling apart happens early in the show to give the appearance that I can escape from anything, but also to give the illusion that not everything is under my control. Whereas everything is under my control. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, you know, so important to add to your character, but you're right that there are a lot of magician in trouble plots that are contrived. And sometimes we, we try to, I mean, I, I think so many magicians have all done the thing of like some imaginary guy challenged you and decided to shuffle your cards face up and face yep. down at some point, you know, because we're, we're trying to create that magician and trouble yep. plot because although it, it, it's, it's interesting to the spectator, it's usually interesting when it actually happens in yep. real life, when you actually are challenged, not when mm-hmm. you <laughs> create a scenario in which you were challenged. Magician in Trouble is a theatrical device that uh, works as a scripting element. It doesn't work as a plot. Hmm. This quote that I see here is, uh, magic is one of the subtlest and most difficult of the sciences and arts. There is more opportunity for error of comprehension, judgment, and practice than in any other branch of physics. I disagree. Because uh, if you mess up that, physics, you're going to actually kill people. <laughs> that quote is not about sleight of hand, though. That quote is from Aleister Crowley, who believed in blood magic. Oh, yeah. I like how it's just Crowley. I didn't make a connection because I didn't. Obviously, I knew who Aleister Crowley was. Mm-hmm. But yeah. uh... <laughs> that is not a quote about what we're talking about. That is a quote about uh, silly hoodoo that is yeah. not real. That yeah, is, that's that is magic. Quote, that's magic with a K. That is quote from a man who thought that he could have sex into teleportation. Wait, but maybe we just I've been thinking about this all wrong. <laughs> Wait, what are you telling me? <laughs> I, I, you that you that you sex can just, is not a viable mode of moving goods. <laughs> it's not a viable mode. Of- <laughs> it's not. It's I, I will. I would prefer a heavy goods vehicle to humping. In order maybe. to sell product. <laughs> in order to sell product. Man, maybe you're just not like, trying log- hard enough. Alice logistic- didn't what he was talking about. Logistically speaking, I'm just I'm just talking about logistics here. Shipping containers are more <laughs> effective for getting products to customers. I mean potentially however we yeah. have to remind be reminded that it is one of the most <laughs> subtle and difficult of the sciences and arts so <laughs> you might just not be as nuanced as mr crowley uh, fair <laughs> wait is mr crowley about alistair crowley uh the are song? you talking about the, the song? ozzy osbourne I, song i uh, probably i don't know i mean that guy was weird yeah, that guy was weird too. Um, interesting. Wow, that's great that you knew that quote because I was like, that is definitely not true in any way. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, and that's also an interesting thing is like the even the term layman kind of is rather condescending when we think that if we mess up what we do, someone's just slightly less entertained. Whereas if a physicist messes up what they do or like someone who's in, in, in charge of like designing a bridge, messes up what they do Mm -hmm. then there are serious consequences that impact the world and uh yeah i mean i don't know i mean there there can be serious consequences if a magician uses their powers incorrectly i mean how many people have been screwed up by uh uh by sylvia brown or edward fuck nuts or you know i mean like all those all those people um yeah man that's also very true like like nightmare alley yeah yeah it's uh it's it's you know 
you you can you can really change someone's world if you do magic correctly and if you do it incorrectly you can change their world for the worse true true that yeah i think that we forget the amount of impact that we can have yeah especially with mentalism um we have a uh wait, wait what <laughs> eric leclerc want on a live morning show and intentionally botched five magic tricks for one final card between plates okay i want to check that out um we have the iq test for you guys all right today. and uh i think that it is important that uh that we find out how you stack up against all right. other guests it's that time it's time for my favorite rhyme it's time for the iq test let's see if you're better than the rest it's time for the iq test let's see if you're better than the rest So you've already heard of Lasagna. So because you've already done that very important question in your previous interview, everybody check out his answer to that. Lasagna. Question. But I felt like it would be good to hit you with a good all, you know, 45 second jingle to, <laughs> to really spice up the night, you know? <laughs> He's ready. He's ready for the IQ test, dude. Yes. That was sick. All right. How do you put a giraffe into a refrigerator? How do I put a giraffe into a refrigerator? Yes. How do you put a giraffe into a refrigerator? Uh, carefully and in pieces. Carefully and in pieces. Yes. All right. Okay. So I'll remember that, uh, that answer. Uh, carefully and in pieces. Question two. How do you put an elephant into a refrigerator? Uh, carefully and in pieces with a forklift. With a forklift. All right. Big, okay. Bigger animal. Bigger animal. Uh, true, but still in pieces carefully. All right. Mm -hmm. um, now, question three. The Lion King is hosting an animal conference. All the animals attend except one. Which animal does not attend? Uh, which Lion King are we talking about? The Lion King. No, but like there have been multiple Lion Kings. Are we talking about Mufasa? Are we talking about Scar? Are we talking about I would Simba? Say, I would say whoever the current King of the Lions is, is the one hosting the Animal Conference. Uh, the one that does not attend? Yeah, the uh, Lion King is hosting an Animal Conference. All the animals attend except one. Which animal does not attend? The ones in the refrigerator? The ones in the refrigerator. So which animal? I mean, like, uh, his, his name is Gary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Gary. <laughs> Gary's in the fridge. And <laughs> he does not attend. All right. What type of animal is Gary? Uh, well, apparently he's either chopped up into pieces. He's, he's, he's in pieces, so he's either a giraffe or an elephant. <laughs> he's, he's like a sushi roll. Yes. <laughs> giraffe, an elephant. All right. Final question. There is a river you must cross, but it is inhabited by crocodiles. How do you solve the problem? There's a river you must cross, but it's inhabited you must cross by it. But uh, but it's inhabited by crocodiles. <laughs> How do you solve the problem? Yeah, but it is inhabited by crocodiles. How do you solve the problem? Is is the problem that I have to cross the river that is inhabited by crocodiles, or are we talking about another problem such as the arrangement of the pieces of the giraffe and the <laughs> elephant in the same? <laughs> You have uh, to in the same it, refrigerator. Are are you concerned about how you have to Tetris the pieces? I am concerned about how I have to Tetris the pieces uh, and I, because I you didn't give me any information as to how big the refrigerator was or if the problem was the uh, the, the river that I was crossing or that it was filling that or if it was a, another problem. Hey, hey, you're getting a little bit heated there. Hey, I'm, I'm, <laughs> the problem is saying, you must cross the river. 
the okay in 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 regards to the the river crossing um uh i would uh i would use um well if it's me traveling i come prepared uh mm. so uh and by prepared i mean i come i i usually go on safari with uh the tumbler uh, the Batman tumbler. So I just use the the jet the jet boost because it's it's designed to jump over rivers to lay down the bridge. The bridge never really worked, but the car worked just fine. So, so you're going to be using a Batman device in order to uh, to cross. Yeah, the tumbler. The tumbler. Can we look yeah. up? A, I'm gonna look up a photo of the tumbler. Yeah, just, just Batman get... the tumbler. You know, from from uh, Batman Begins. I've not seen it, good sir. Batman tumbler. You haven't seen Batman yes. Begins with Christian Bale? Mm -mm. Yeah, there's a Lego model. Yeah, oh, right this there. is the Tumblr? Yeah, that's oh, the Tumblr. This a million times. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's dope. Okay, so you're going to yeah. cross... I mean, like, it's literally designed for river crossing. Uh, Fox says it is. It is so, designed to do that. So you're saying... Uh, if I if I have this correct, the, the first answer was that you needed to put the giraffe... Um, gently into the uh into the refrigerator. I did not say gently, I said carefully. Carefully, carefully and in pieces. And just like our good old friend Ossie Wind, you said that you need to Come on, bro. Come on. Don't you not not play. Well, that's sad. So he said, <laughs> he said you need to tetris the pieces. Uh we have a quote from Ossie. Um, let's see if this can so, uh, so Aussie and I are both vivisecting giraffes is is what you're saying yes if vivisecting giraffes <laughs> that you're chopping up into pieces yes. Um, yes. I'm trying to get well I can't get these quotes from Aussie to play as drops sad face but uh, yeah he said you need to Tetris the pieces so you and Aussie okay. are on the same page however you are both um, you know borderline incapable of functioning in society because the correct answer was open the refrigerator, put the giraffe in and close the door. This question tests whether you're doing simple things in a complicated way. So you're making it too hard on yourself, man. I you're mean, the text. implication is that I would open and close the refrigerator. Yeah. You know, the implication is yes, you open the refrigerator, put the giraffe and close so the door. Basically your answer is wrong. No, basically, your answer. You're, que you're questioning Aussie Wind, one of the finest minds in magic, and a FISM winner. One of the finest minds in magic, however, one of the worst minds when it comes to giraffe refrigerator logistics. All right. Uh, let's go to the second question. How do you put an elephant into a refrigerator? I like your creative answers, though. This is more yeah. a creativity test than an IQ test, to be honest. But okay. how do you put an elephant into a refrigerator? I think you're going to regret your answer at this point. Okay. Uh, what What do you think the answer is? Uh, it's the same as the giraffe one, and it's just uh, it's a question as to whether or not you repeat the same tasks. Unfortunately, that is the wrong answer. Open the refrigerator, put in the elephant, and close the refrigerator. Correct answer: Open the refrigerator, take out the giraffe, put in the elephant, and close the door. This tests your ability to think through the repercussions of your actions. Now, uh, okay. So also, the, okay. Actions. The question is also flawed because it does not imply that it is the same refrigerator. We only have one. It's a refrigerator. Yeah, but you don't state that. If you're going to, if if those are going to be the responses to the question, you there you are missing information there that is very important. Huh? What? I, what do you mean? Okay, the Lion King is hosting an animal conference. All the animals attend except the answer one. is definitely Gary, and I don't give a shit what is underneath that. <laughs> it's definitely Gary, but what kind of animal is Gary? It you doesn't say, say what kind. It just says which. It's not my fault your questions are flawed, Blaze. <laughs> Gary is good friends with Timon and Pumbaa, but he is an elephant because he's in the fridge. Right? This uh, this tests your memory. Uh, you're but just you're missing so much information. This is this, this is, is the, the reason pub country. this is the reason public school there is, is a failing. river you must cross, but it is inhabited by crocodiles. How do you solve the problem? Mm -hmm. And you said that you needed to break out your tumbler, which was never a part of the question in in this flawed logic however comma luckily there is the saving grace of the fact that we know that all of the crocodiles are currently attending 
the Lion King animal. We cover. don't know that. <laughs> so you swim across. You swim across. Man. No, no, no. That the, the question implies that the crocodiles are in the river at the time. This is no, bad. They, they inhabit the river. However, you are not inhibited by these crocodiles. They simply inhabit this terrain. Well, you never told me that you only had one refrigerator. So, <laughs> you, you, but uh, you know, um, unfortunately, Gary uh, is not a crocodile. Yeah. Or no, no, no. Actually, fortunately for you, Gary is not a crocodile because he's the one guy that didn't attend, and they were. Uh, these they are bad questions, and I don't like. I don't like them. Now, I, uh, I don't. <laughs> Now, this is so much harder without Ryan here because he's the one that introduced this IQ test. And so trying to defend this quiz that is not my own is all Ryan, right. these are bad questions and you're a bad person and you should feel bad. But at least at least he's got a kid. At least at least he's at least he's chilling with his bebe right now. OK, all right, fine. And uh, yes, this is part of the 2025 FISM judging criteria. So, yes. uh, you know, good thing that you already scored really high and uh, have ended your competing career because now you're not going to be able to handle all of this uh, crocodiles nope. and and Tetris and lasagna, man. It's a... Uh... It's, uh, it's crazy. We do have a compilation of people's reactions to the IQ test because we we dropped this as a segment a long time ago for many reasons. But, you know, I because the like, questions are bad. Because the questions are bad. But look at how riled up you're getting, man. This is a good interview. Lasagna! I mean, isn't this the best show you've ever been a part of? So I'd like to now transition. Um, first to uh to your new favorite hoodie which of course as we know is the co most comfortable hoodie you're going to own the lasagna mathematics hoodie one plus one equals one because we established in your previous interview that we do end up with an infinite chain of lasagna correct 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 so we're on the same page about that i think that it's better for us to get back to common ground instead of the things that divide us <laughs> now if you were to give, <laughs> if you were to give advice to someone in the chat who's interested in becoming a uh, a professional magician, where would you recommend that they begin? Well, they'd start by apparently finding uh, out how many refrigerators the venue you're going to has, particularly mm -hmm. if that venue has giraffes or elephants. Uh, and if want specifically, if they were to go to Penguin Magic. Oh, Where would uh, you begin on your site? Uh, if they want to become a professional magician, they should just type Eric Tate in the search bar and buy all of the products that show up on that page. Nice. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, like, if they want to become a professional magician, I think that, uh, you know, finding good, nice pieces of magic uh, should be, is, is what to do. I think they should try a lot of different stuff and then see which ones they like. Uh, then also figure out the kind of magic that they want to do. They want to do like formal close up. They want to do stage. They want to do uh, parlor. Do they want to tour comedy clubs? They want to do cocktail hours. I mean, it, and it's a, it's a varied question. It depends on what. I mean, the first question is to figure out what kind of professional magician you want to be. Hmm. No, I think that's a great answer because I think so many people get into magic and they're like, where do I begin? And it's probably yeah. best to figure out what you're interested in doing in magic, mm -hmm. and then you can yeah. learn from there. Instead of just being like, I'm going to learn everything and I'm going to do everything. It's like, you know, that is that is one way to start. But yeah. then it's a lot less focused. Um, but yes, I, I, I do highly recommend that everybody go check out penguinmagic.com slash magician slash Eric dash Tate. And you can also check out all of the different releases and uh, wonderful things that he has uh, been a part of, especially like his Leonard Green work is outstanding. Now, have you met Leonard before? Uh, once I'm actually in his penguin live lecture. He sits wow. me down at the table and teaches me how to do the snap deal, even though I, I already knew how to do the snap deal at that time, but it was so cool. So that's so cool. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. So did you get a chance to talk with him at all afterwards? Yeah, a little bit. It was after his, it was pretty recently after his second stroke. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah. he was pretty tired. So we didn't get to have like a deep in depth conversation, but you know, maybe one day we'll get to hang out together. Yeah. Would you say that he's been one of your biggest inspirations in oh, that? Yeah. 
hugely, yeah. hugely inspiring. Mm. Who would you say are your top three? Uh, Leonard Green, uh, Simon Lovell, and Ben Earl. Mm. I think I think yeah. they've had a pretty pretty significant impact on my uh, my mm. life. Uh, with John Armstrong being a close fourth. Mm. Yeah. And finally, is there? A, is there something that you feel is a current wave in magic that you feel is reflective of what the future of magic is going to look like to you? Is there something that you see on the horizon in magic that you think is coming up or, um, or not? Um, you know, that's interesting because I tend to look at magic right now, like in a very product focused way, just because that's what I do day to day. Um, and so I see a lot of I see a lot of people exploring magnets in like new ways. That's really interesting. And there's a lot of people who are like reinventing the wheel when it comes to magnets with like existing stuff that's been out for a long time. But Absolutely. now it's just like easier to do things because magnet technology has gotten better. Wow. Um, there's yeah, there's some really cool stuff going on with magnets right now where there's like a whole group of creators that are doing neat stuff. Um, but I find that. Uh, like parlor is coming back in a big way, I think because mm -hmm. of all the magic theaters that have opened up. And so there's yeah. like, there's a new group of performers who's sort of like rediscovering how to do parlor magic in like a really, a really significant way. That's um, exciting. That are, wow. that are creating like really exciting, really phenomenal shows. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Cause it, it definitely, I think became a, um, I guess an underserved medium for a while of magic. Yeah. That there wasn't that venue as much you know you either had a very close upsetting you know or you had full-on big stage shows and so it's yeah. nice to see those kind of medium-sized settings where you can do some close-up material and you can do some stage material and you have that flexibility and also material that's meant specific for that setting as oh well. yeah yeah uh, yeah and you just and, yeah go ahead Sorry. We had a question from Tigger T as well that was just uh, saying, uh, you know, I see that you write for the monthly ma magazine Penguin does. Uh, how in how far in advance do you guys plan them? Who's like who's going on? What tricks are part of it? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So I uh, I do write for Penguin Magic Monthly. I write the spotlight. So it's usually a, a preview of like the lectures that are going to be coming up or a lecture that I watched recently that I thought should be sort of like uh, have a spotlight put on it. Um, but if you email Josh Birch at penguinmagic.com, you can submit your own articles. Josh is our editor. Uh, we are always looking for con uh, contributions. If you've never been published before, uh, Ma Penguin Magic Monthly is a great place to get your first stuff published. Uh, we're always looking for contributors. Um, and it's uh, just uh, email Josh at penguinmagic.com and uh, he can tell you a little bit more about kind of what he's looking for. But uh, the magazine there's certain elements of the magazine that are planned out uh you know months and months and months in advance um but as far as like the actual like magazines themselves uh i think they sort of come together uh about two to three months before they're published mm. um but a lot of the, but it's like we will know that like so with the magazine we are so we have like a a, a cover person someone who's on the cover i think um uh, and then there's always a free gimmick is always included in every penguin magic monthly. Mm. And frequently what happens is the theme of the magazine will be around mm -hmm. what that gimmick is. So we'll, ha we'll solicit things from people where it's like, Hey, we're including a double backer this month, or we're including envelopes this month, or there's like a really cool sticker that you can turn a coin into a copper silver. And so we'll have a bunch of copper silver routines in there. Um, but then we have like other things that are not related to the theme that get put in there. And, uh, and that's how that stuff gets in there. If it's just really cool and Josh is looking for some space to fill, uh, that's where it'll go. But just email Josh at penguinmagic.com. Nice. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And, yeah. uh, yeah. probably a good place to wrap up, uh, is yep. that Gary is in the comments and he said, Hey guys, I can't find any of my friends. Usually the crocodiles are hanging out in the river, but they're all gone. So we really hope that Gary <laughs> is able to find his friends um, because he uh, he's really left alone from this Lion King animal conference. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, <laughs> we can't end it there. We can't end it there. I hate everything. We can't. What is, what are some of your biggest interests outside of magic and how do you feel that they inspire your magic and performance style or creative process? Is um, I don't know. I'm, 
interested in a lot of things. I like animals. I like photography. Uh, big into my dogs. I got I got a couple of Chihuahua mixes that I cruise around with a lot. Um, yeah. I play a lot of video games. I watch a lot of uh, fantasy and sci-fi stuff. Um, I'm really into Lego. Mm. I like build. I like building Lego a lot. Um, uh, it's just a, a lot of stuff. I'm a big, I'm a big old nerd. You've got a lot of different creative interests and a lot of different creative outlets. So that's yeah, really great. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I take inspiration from a magic where I can, but also like, I like playing with weird concepts, um, in magic. I like, uh, I'm fascinated by conspiracy theories. And so I try and play with a lot of conspiracy theory, like logic or like premises in my magic. Mm. Um, so like, you know, I've got an oil and water, that is like all centered around the Mandela effect. So my cards across my own water is not really presented as like the cards separating or moving, but it's more like uh, playing with memory. Um, mm. I'm also like fascinated with like time travel and, and the implications of it and like playing with time, um, uh, which is, which is fun. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I play around with a lot of different stuff. So like I just finished playing cyberpunk 2077. I just finished a first play through that. Mm. And there was a lot of like, really interesting concepts about like humanity and like what it means to be human uh that were uh really really interesting to play with wow do you do you feel like magic is kind of an amalgamation of a lot of your different interests that you can incorporate you know plots or storylines or things from from other things that you're inspired by and then incorporate them into your magic yeah magic is mostly a way for me to like I started off as a juggler uh, a long time ago. And so I, um, I'm more attracted to the physical slights of magic. And then like a lot of everything else is, Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, so a lot of times it's me like playing with a particular move that pleases me. And then, then the, the plot comes in later. And then like some of the interests end up in my, uh, mm. my presentations. Um, yeah. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of like how that all comes together, but it's, I, I, I do a lot of like creativity through play is kind mm -hmm. of how that, that works. It's like sort of, I improvise my way through things and then I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And I keep that. That almost sounds like, um, Mario Lopez, what he was talking about at yeah. Blackpool, you know, he was talking about how a lot of his creative process is kind of finding a move or a prop and another one and, and playing with them and seeing how they play together. And it's, and I, I think that that's really cool that you have, yeah. you are yeah. such an intellectual person and have a very analytical mind yet are also able to just kind of play and still have that fun as part of your creative process for something that is going to end up being very serious work in the end. Yeah, I mean, I think that like be that initial like creativity, like burst of creativity, I think is like really hard for me to capture, which I think is why I don't create a lot of things. I don't like put out a lot of new thing. I do, you know, I do a lot of like tricks that are like out there um, mm. and I end up finding new presentations and new ways to present it. But like when actually like coming up with the tricks is not something I'm like terribly good at, I think. Yeah. Um, and so like going like, oh, this is what I want to do. Like usually I see somebody else or say something else where I'm like, oh, like it'd be really cool if I could do that um, because I saw something like that happen. Um, there's actually like a card number type trick that I'm playing with a lot right now. Uh, that is something I saw Larry Wilmore do in a session at the castle. And now I've been like, oh, this is fun. I wanted to. So there was like a there was a moment that I thought was really interesting. And so I've been playing with that because I thought that moment was interesting and I had a different way to get that moment. Mm. Um, yeah. And so a lot of times like that's kind of where a lot of that stuff comes from. And then, then it's like the sit, the sitting down and going like, Oh, okay, how could I do this better? And then it's, it's, it's that it's that. Yeah. Yeah. Just thinking like, how would I do this? You know? Yeah. I, I mm -hmm. so, yeah. I think yeah. that, and the, and the answer is always use a snap deal or palm a card. <laughs> palm a card and I think that's a great way to end it i think that like throughout this there have been so many times where i wanted to drop the gold nugget but there i didn't want to interrupt what you were saying because there were so many really wonderful insights and I, I just really appreciate you coming on man and thank you so much for taking the time especially after such an incredible accomplishment and thank you for representing Anytime. america as well in in the world stage of magic so that's a i mean it's been it's really rare for americans to be to 
score anywhere near as highly as you. So I think that's really, really, you know, incredible. And so thank you for thank being you. representative and also being so encouraging of other people to uh, to get up and get ready to compete. So yeah. I'm interested in doing uh, Italy, and uh, I hope other people are as well in the chat that are inspired you do by it. this conversation. So you should do it. Thanks again for coming on, man. And uh, if people want to check out your stuff, they should check out the Penguin Magic Podcast on uh, anywhere they can find podcasts on, you know, yep. Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, whatever. And uh, for you particularly, there's uh, the link in the description, Instagram.com slash Eric Tate. And uh, where else should people look for you? Check out your releases. Uh, on music. That's it. I mean, I think Instagram and uh, at some point I'm going to start streaming on Twitch again. Um so I just, but I don't know when that's going to happen. I need, I need to figure out what I'm, what I'm doing. I gotta, I gotta go back and finish writing my book and, mm. and, and work on some other stuff. So yeah. Wow. Got a lot going on. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much again. And uh, everybody really appreciate you being a part of this. Check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash all access magic to support the show and get access to our extra episodes every week. And we'll see you all very soon.